Okay, let me call to order uh, this meeting of the City of Bloomington Planning Commission uh, for Thursday, April 1st, 2021. Uh, let's begin by calling the roll. Whistler? Here. Kenzie? Here. St. John? Here. Burrell? Here. Herrera? <clears throat> Here. Seabor? Here. Sandberg? Here. Cockrum? Here. Kate? Here. And Enright Randolph? Here. Great. All right, so we do have a quorum. Um, before we jump in um, and, and pick up uh, with ZO 09-21, are there any, um, any other reports or communications from staff or commissioners before we get started? Um, no, I don't think we have any um, unrelated to tonight's business. Uh, we will have to, I'm sure you will describe, um, re-vote um, on yep. Amendment 3. Yep, that would yep. be it. Okay, so um, we are essentially picking up where we left off after the last uh, meeting on Monday. Uh, as you may recall, we, we did um, uh, vote to uh, suspend the rules and continue debate on Amendment 3, um, which we did and, and con concluded with uh, the vote on Amendment 3, um, uh, where we made a, a, a slight error in process there um, because our rules state that in order to um, suspend those rules, we really need that vote to be uh, unanimous. So um, just to make sure that we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's, um, we, we need to re-vote on Amendment 3 because uh, technically that vote was, um, was after um, the meeting had uh, or, or should have ended. So we just want to make sure that we, we do this um, uh, appropriately. So we're going to start by just, um, just calling the roll once again on Amendment 3. Um, just the, the same way that we did at the end of uh, the meeting on Monday night uh, to make sure that everything is uh, is appropriately recorded. Um, and then once we're done with that, we will be back to final um, comments, final debate um, uh, on uh, petition ZO09-21 as amended. Um, and we will take public comment on uh, on the final uh, recommendation uh, on zero zero nine dash twenty one. So, um, to begin, Jackie, would you just uh, call the call the roll again? Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? We're going to just call the roll again on on Amendment Number Three, um, which was um, was eliminating the. Uh, um, Can you uh, would you mind repeating the amendment? So. Sure. So Amendment 3 was to remove the use-specific standard uh, related to the um, separation of 150 feet um, uh, for approved duplexes in the R1 through R3, um, the 150 feet uh, for uh, two years. The uh, amendment was to remove that use-specific standard. Yeah, I believe that passed 6-3. Six, three. Six, three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other so questions? Okay. Could I have a, a clarification, please? So we're voting on that amendment, not the issue of continuing the meeting. I, I'm not still not clear what needs to be unanimous. Yeah. So 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 basically, when we took the vote um, to suspend the rules and continue the meeting on Monday night, um, because that vote wasn't unanimous, uh, we technically should have ended the meeting at 9 p.m. Um, we didn't realize at the time that that vote needed to be unanimous in order to continue the meeting. So by our rules, we took a vote after 9 p.m. And that vote isn't, is, isn't valid because it happened um, after the meeting should have ended at, at 9 p.m. So we're just going to vote again tonight just to make sure that we've recorded that vote. Um, now, we don't need to vote on continuing the meeting again because it's in the past <laughs> that ship has already sailed we just want to okay. record the vote so again and make sure our vote is the same vote as before that's right Got this it. is Thank you. this is just the exact same vote that we took at the very end of the meeting on monday yep we're just we're just doing it again to make sure it's on the record properly 
And just for clarification purposes, we rules allow us to go till 930, but we can't introduce anything after nine. Both of those that 930 was obviously surpassed as well. But just in case we get to that point tonight and uh, have that discussion again. Yeah, if we do that again, uh, and that, that's totally my fault. I didn't realize that vote needed to be unanimous. We, there was a majority that wanted to continue meeting, but going forward, um, we'll, we'll keep in mind that that's supposed to be unanimous if we're going to suspend the rules and, and go past um, 930 or introduce something new after 9 p.m. Great. Okay, so uh, Kenzie? Yes. St. John? Yes. Burrell? Yes. Herrera? No. Seabor? No. Sandberg? No. Cockrum? Yes. Kate? Yes. And Whistler? Yes. Amendment passes 6-3. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, we are now back to uh, ZO 09-21 uh, as amended. We have adopted two amendments, the Amendment 2 and Amendment 3. And so we are now just back to our, our uh, discussion on uh, the petition as amended. Um, we've had a couple other amendments that have been um, suggested, but I think withdrawn. So I want to make sure before we go any further um, that we don't have any other amendments um, to, to be introduced before we begin our, our final uh, discussion on the petition as amended. So, so just to clarify, Amendment 4 from Commissioner K was withdrawn, the Amendment 4? Yes. She withdrew it. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So yeah, Commissioner K, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think, so that amendment was withdrawn given the votes to go by right. Uh, because that original amendment four was about adding some further language to the conditional use criteria um, and that's no longer relevant so i went ahead and withdrew that um, the only other thing i just wanted to say and i don't know the appropriate time in all of these proceedings but i'll take this time since it seems to be logical here is at the end of our last meeting i mentioned that i had voted for amendment three uh, in uh, and at the same time wanted to explore a cap uh, as an alternative to that, um, I spent uh, a while after that meeting drafting various um, uh, potential caps uh, and talking with staff uh, and folks about this. And I was unable to come up with one that in all candor um, I thought really would fly. Um, so I uh, had originally circulated an amendment or something that looked like the beginnings of an amendment for that but I've withdrawn that too. So just so that everyone is clear on the status of that, um, that's uh, the status. There is no additional amendment that uh, speaks to caps, so. Thank you. Um, before we go to uh, public comment then, are there any, um, any final questions for staff or for other commissioners about um, about ZO 09-21, where we stand. Um, any, any final questions before we go to, to the final public comment on the petition as amended? I have uh, one. Commissioner, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, sorry. Um, so it, in addition to um, Commissioner Kate's response, I too was interested in trying to do something that would allow for some more measured and um, monitored approach to this and talk some options over with staff as well. And um, in the process though, wanna mention something. While I, I don't think any form of um, codified language or a new amendment would necessarily work in the way I think all of us are imagining, which is just doing this in a slightly more monitored and um, measured way of uh, by introducing density, that there's a one of the um, things that's at our disposal is when this is forwarded to council, it is accompanied by a series of um, whereas clauses that are part of that process, but something that aren't not something that we vote on or or 
uh, develop language for here. But in that, one of the things that I think is really important that would help both address this goal of introducing density, but also um, protecting some of the um, concerns about a swift or an overly swift conversion um, to, you know, uh, in a way that people might not want, that might not respect the unique character of these neighborhoods, um, that there would be a way to add sections or add whereas clauses that would detail how the petition is being applied that would allow some things like um, that the report, there would be some reporting requirements, that there would be a report that could be produced every six months to the council or to the plan commission just to oversee this process as it went along. And, and then presumably if there was a concern about anything that was being reported about its application that we could take action if we deemed it going differently than what we expected. So there would be a way to kind of enact um, or take some action without having to have an amendment to codify that. So that's something that I think is one worth knowing that that's possible. And I also hope that the public who have joined us here again um, in, in force tonight might be uh, appreciate hearing that there's more that goes into this as well that would allow us um, a little more measured response than I think there's some fear out there. Um, so. So that's one thing that, that I think is worth knowing uh, before we proceed with this. And Jackie, and, and I don't think Scott is with us here this evening, but if there's any elaboration on this, or if I got some of it wrong, please, please correct me. Sure, uh, I, I'll just take a quick second to, uh, yes, that's kind of what, what we've been saying, um, similar to what we did with the uh, ADU proposal. Um, we uh, at that time committed to coming back to council after 12 months, uh, and we did. I went and gave a report about how many had been applied for, where they were, what issues we had um, seen with administration, those types of things. Uh, and then uh, council did not have concerns. We didn't um, actively change the uh, work to change the um, uh, legislation at that time and also presented it to plan commission. Um, so yes, the idea here is that we would do that probably in a shorter time period, uh, likely six months. Um, and um, yes, we would be able to put that in the, it wouldn't go be codified, but it would go in the ordinance that it, uh, were this to be approved by council, the ordinance that would be um, signed by um, uh, council leadership as well as the mayor. Uh, in the sections, um, we can add under the whereas clauses, we can add uh, you know, a commitment to doing that and what that would mean. So going back every six months and that if there are uh, concerns from those that have been um, approved or, uh, uh, you know, whatever has happened as a result of the uh, regulations that we would uh, revisit those. So yeah, that um, putting that in there, I think was a good idea we got from a legal department um, where then it doesn't have to go into the UDO, but is still uh, written and agree, you know, um, people are wary of, uh, for, of me just saying, yes, we're gonna come back every six months. So we'll go ahead and uh, write that down uh, and where it's uh, agreed upon with the department um, and uh, council and the administration. Thank you, Jackie. To me, that seems like a way to address some of the, um, the sentiment in the pause um, request that we receive and would allow us to move to take some action, but do it in a more measured way. So I, I hope people um, are interested in something like that and support it. It's not something we can vote on or that would be a formal amendment, but I think it's important to know. So thank you for that elaboration, Jackie. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from commissioners? So yeah, uh, Commissioner Whistler. So Jackie, if I, if I um, could ask, so after um, going over uh, in the plan commission, <clears throat> uh, going over this document, so it will go to the council and it would be something that is going to take place uh, in, in this term in, in a spring or we're going to um, wait something from the council members in, in fall. Good question. Okay, so um, a text amendment, um, uh, like some of our other petitions as well, uh, once council has received it certified from staff, 
uh, from the from planning transportation with your it's actually from plan commission, uh, but I just put it together for you. Uh, they have 90 days to make a decision. So it will be spring. Um, they have a, a summer recess that begins in the middle of June. Um, and so they will uh, um, see this legislation uh, in in that time period is my understanding. The map as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from commissioners? All right, then we will go to uh, public comment. Um, this is comment on our uh, final recommendation. We will um, we will be uh, moving to forward this on to the city council um, uh, with a recommendation. Um, and uh, so that's what we're uh, having comment on now is, um, is what our final recommendation should be here. And- Commissioner um, Whistler, I can I um, ask one more question? Um, yes, sure, go ahead. Um, sorry, so um, are we, it might be good for to state for the people on the call, are we planning to present the map tonight? We will, we'll, we will get to that tonight or- it, we will if we have time. It, it really just depends on how much, uh, how long the public comment goes. Um, Absolutely. I just think it's, we've yeah, said that at the point. beginning. Of, yeah, yeah, I should have said that, that, that uh, we do intend, um, obviously, of course, depending on how long discussion for uh, ZO0921 goes, but we do intend to at least introduce ZO1021, which is the map. Yeah, so as, as soon as we, Conclude ZO09-21, we will introduce uh, ZO10-21. Um, unless, of course, uh, it's after 9 p.m. And at that point, it would require a, uh, a unanimous vote for us to introduce that tonight. So, um, but our, yeah, our intention is to continue, continue moving through this um, as, as soon as we can. So if... Um, and, and I would I would expect that at this point we probably will at least get it introduced tonight. Um, I think it's probably unlikely that we will get to uh, a second uh, public comment tonight. So I, I doubt that we'll get to public comment on CO 10-21, the map tonight. That will most likely uh, end up being continued until Monday. But if we have time, we will at least get it introduced and, and start the discussion tonight. Um, any other questions before we begin with public comment? And the public has five minutes, is that correct? That is correct. The, each speaker will have five minutes here on this, uh, this final comment. We limited it to three on the amendments, but uh, it's five minutes uh, per person for the, uh, the comment on the petition itself. Um, before we get started, I see some of you have already raised your hands, but if you'd like to make comments, um, you can raise your virtual hand by um, clicking on the reactions button or the participants button, depending on your version of Zoom, um, and clicking the button that says raise hand. If you cannot find that, uh, feel free to send a chat um, either uh, to, um, uh, to myself or to, uh, to Jackie Scanlon. And, uh, and request to be, uh, to be recognized. So um, let me um, just, just quickly, once again, we, what, we're, what we're doing here is final comment on ZO09-21, which is uh, all of the um, amendments regarding, uh, regarding plexus. So um, if you haven't seen that, if this is your first meeting, um, can we perhaps get the, um, the link posted in the chat here um, to, the, uh, to the petition itself so that anybody who's kind of uh, joining now and, and not sure where we are uh, has access to that. So we're, we're talking about our final recommendation to the city council uh, on amendments to uh, the UDO regarding, um, regarding plexus. And we'll, yeah, we'll get that posted in the chat yep. uh, for anyone who has questions. All right, so um, 
Uh, Jackie will recognize you when it's your turn to speak. You'll have five minutes. Please, before you begin speaking, state your full name uh, for the record. And uh, we'll be um, the, on, on Jackie's shared screen here. You'll see the, uh, the time counting down. And we'll let you know when your time is up. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, Dave Warren, are you there? Yep, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. All right, thank you and good evening. My name is Dave Warren. Uh, I recently earned a PhD in public affairs from the O'Neill School at IU. Um, have taught a class on local government there called Urban Problems and Solutions since 2015. And I'm a member of Neighbors United Bloomington Monroe County. Neighbors United is a group of people from the city and county interested in long-term interjurisdictional evidence-based solutions to housing problems across the spectrum from homelessness to middle-class housing needs and everything in between. We've been meeting with folks from across the city and county, including school board members, faith groups, nonprofits, and others across policy areas because of how housing connects with virtually every aspect of life, from where you go to school to how close you are to a transit stop to how likely you are to interact with law enforcement on a day-to-day -day basis. While we are organizing for the long term, some of us are here tonight because zoning reform is a big part of that long-term solution. I'm here in support of the two text amendments you passed for several reasons. The first reason is a big number, 36,000. That's two sold out assembly halls worth of people. 36,000 is also the number of people who work in the city of Bloomington, but don't live there according to the city's hospital site redevelopment report. Of course, some of those 36,000 chose to live outside the city and it's totally fine to make that choice. But thousands of those 36,000 people would probably live in the city if they could afford to, which would, which would have the added benefit of this, uh, to the city of increasing local income tax revenues without a lit rate increase. Uh, those are revenues that can support low income housing programs and our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Living further away means fewer transportation options, generally resulting in added auto congestion and emissions. More people living outside the city also means more development pressure on the county's greenfields and rural landscapes. Indeed, 80% of housing added outside the city of Bloomington and town of Ellettsville since 2015 took the form of detached single family houses on relatively large lots, eating up more land in the county according to the county, county's planning department data. Why does this happen? How are we such an unaffordable and sprawling place to live? A big, reason, uh, a big reason is that the government of the city of Bloomington, like Monroe County's government and local governments of most jurisdictions in the United States, use their zoning code to prioritize the most expensive type of home, the detached single family house. You get what you plan for, and for decades, Bloomington has planned in a way that makes living in our community exceedingly unattainable, unattainable for folks who lack high incomes or wealth. That has to change. High housing prices and rents uh, are known to generate racially and economically inequitable outcomes in communities where population growth surpasses available homes. In Indiana, according to the Census Bureau's American Community Survey for 2019, the median black household in the state makes $25,000 less per year than the median white Indiana household. Hispanic households make $13,000 less per year. When our zoning code forbids anything but the most expensive type of home from being added to most neighborhoods, that makes it that much harder for neighborhoods to develop in a way that allows lower income families and people of color to live there. Now, will making it easier to add more affordable housing types throughout the city solve affordability problems overnight? Absolutely not. When prices are rising 10 to 15% per year, it's going to take a while for that to improve but we simply can't call for more affordable housing in Bloomington while simultaneously saying no to allowing more affordable housing types to be built on most of its land. And, be, and, people, can't move, and people can't move into older, more affordable places as naturally occurs in healthy housing markets as Jane Jacobs observed, observed so long ago, if there aren't new homes for people to move into. Moving towards more inclusive zoning rules is not just a big city phenomenon. By the end of June, every municipality, over 10,000 people in the entire state of Oregon will no longer be able to use exclusionary single family zoning within their borders. Just a couple weeks ago, the city, uh, the city council of Berkeley, California, a small city with a big university just like Bloomington, voted nine to zero to move toward eliminating single family zoning by the end of next year. The federal government via actions by the Biden administration and in a Senate bill and in a bill already passed by the Democratic House is signaling its willingness to start tying federal dollars to local government efforts to eliminate exclusionary zoning. Local governments have to stop using the long-term planning tool of zoning 
to satisfy short-term desires to keep cert certain housing types or people out. Many other more specific ordinances can address noise, behavior, historic preservation, and other things. Let's use zoning rules as the long-term planning tool they're intended for and remove the inequitable ban on more affordable homes. The Bloomingtonians of 2040 and 2050, tens of thousands of whom haven't even been born yet, will thank us. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Patricia Foster. Thank you. This is the third time that I have addressed the commission. The first time I pointed out the large uncertainties in the current and projected population estimates for Bloomington, but that clearly was uh, made no impression and was ignored. The second time in the interest of just being brief, I simply asked that you say no on the second amendment, but that also made no impression. So this time I'm gonna depart and not be wonky and I'm gonna tell you what I really feel. And what I feel is I'm angry, I'm very angry and I have another number of reasons. The first, I'm angry because you are reintroducing, in fact, a more radical form of the development plan that was rejected last year. And what you just said about adding a, a, a more of a monarchy, it doesn't convince me because you will be deciding what the criteria are, what is good and what is bad instead of the community. I'm also angry because the policies uh, that you're applying were developed for big urban cities and are being blindly applied to Bloomington, a small town dominated by a big university. I'm sorry, but if you think that Berkeley is like Bloomington, you've never been there. Berkeley is part of a very large community of uh, greater San Francisco. I'm angry because the biggest impact on our neighborhoods, which is by bedroom rentals, is not being proper, properly considered and even being made worse by these um, proposals. I'm angry because you're not recognizing that there are over 4,000 units have been built in the, since 2018. And there are another thousand or so on the books for the, for the coming year. These are obviously market rate rentals as are the, uh, the duplexes that you're proposing. That's not what the city needs. It doesn't need any more market rate rental units. It needs affordable housing. And finally, I'm angry because you refuse to work with us the people who would be affected by this sweeping radical change. You didn't work with us to come up with the rational and fair solutions that would take into account the unique features of our neighborhoods and our city overall. Instead, you, you are just blindly applying something that would be appropriate someplace else, but not for Bloomington. So thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Riga Wood. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the past, when I've tried to persuade you that permitting plexus will probably not increase affordable housing, but rather undermine neighborhood values, I haven't been persuasive. So let me tell you a story about what prompts these beliefs. When we moved to Bloomington, we restricted our search of, for housing to homes within a mile of campus for health reasons. And indeed, we did encounter scarcity. One reason for the scarcity is the pressure put on the neighborhood by its proximity to IU. Given that scarcity, we opted to purchase a house formerly occupied by students. Neighbors frequently complained about these particular undergraduates because of noise and because they did things like building a fence on land that was not part of the property. Inside the house, there were also problems such as doors kicked in, cracks in windows, etc. So before moving in, we had to invest a substantial amount of time and money into repairs. Such an investment would not be possible for a younger family with less money and time to invest. That's why plexus near campus are likely to decrease the available of affordable single family houses. Then there are our plans to leave Bloomington. Permitting plexus is likely to increase the amount of money 
we can sell our house for. That's because the house could, without too much difficulty, be repurposed as a duplex. And now for Kelly School entrepreneurs, it would not be financially a good idea. For folks with more modest ambitions, purchasing and remodeling it as a duplex would probably provide a nice steady income. And suppose the occupants of the dwelling units thereby provided attracted the same sort of tenants as previously occupied the house. That seems likely since such tenants are the most likely to be able to afford comparatively higher rent over the short term. And if that happens as comparatively short term occupants, they will not get to know their neighbors. They won't offer to shovel the driveways of older persons or to shop for them when there is an illness. And minor things like that are precisely the things that make Bloomington a caring community. So while this won't always be the case, it's likely to happen and that will undermine neighborhood values. So I ask that you please seriously reconsider the decision to allow plexes, especially plexes by right in our residential neighborhoods close to campus. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Just a sec. Oops. Ms. Allison? Click the stop. Are you there? Let's see. Let me try again. Should be able to unmute. Unmute. Did you do okay, that? there we go. There you go. There we go. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Greetings. <clears throat> Why resurrect the controversial plexus section of the zoning ordinance when the section so plainly opposes the UDO's charge to protect the core neighborhoods, and especially when residents cry out loud and clear that it harms the neighborhoods? Such drastic changes to neighborhood zoning protections should be proposed only to serve some overriding community interest. What might that be? We have heard two arguments. First, to encourage affordable housing. In textbook economics of supply and demand, additional units would bring prices down. But in the real world economics of Bloomington experience, additional units in the core neighborhoods do not reduce overall rental prices. In Bloomington's core neighborhoods, as more of their houses become rentals, rental prices do not fall, but house prices rise. And that reduces the availability of some of our moderately priced single family housing. Second, environmental improvement. The core neighborhoods are already the most compact neighborhoods in the city and the most active environmentally in terms of solar installations, environmentally planned yards and tree cover. They have less land covered by impervious asphalt. They invite walking, biking and are places where children can walk to school. People have invested in the rehabilitation and continued use of already existing homes with no need of additional infrastructure. If high density is good for the environment, there are plenty of such units in the center of the city and more being built under existing zoning. Now, the UDO plan says protect the core neighborhoods. It says so because it is what the community wants and what planning is therefore directed to provide as best it can. These neighborhoods have been lovingly built by neighbors over many generations. They are diverse, vital, historic, and valued. They are now protected. What imperative drives planning to change that protection? 
I have not heard one argument that stands up to the reality here in Bloomington. We all agree we need and want affordable housing of all type, including subsidized housing for the homeless. We need workforce family housing and affordable renting housing for others as well as the students. But this zoning plowed on plexus is not well tailored to address those stated goals. Indeed, it will actually increase prices of single family houses in the core neighborhoods as those houses become double rental units. Why should the city incentivize rental housing at the expense of already scarce single family housing? If we need more units in the center of city, that market is already booming under the present zoning. This upzoning would incentivize and harm the wrong markets. Bloomington is already 65% rental and 35% homeowners. I see no overriding community interest in reversing the UDO's explicit directive to protect the core neighborhoods, especially in the face of the community's opposition. The burden is on the city to justify such a course. The plexus part of the proposed zoning ordinance requires drastic modification before it is passed and sent to the council. Otherwise, the city threatens to set in motion real, real estate investment forces that could change forever the unique face of the city we love and have labored over 30 years to build. Please do not present this as an experiment. If an experiment in upzoning goes bad, a corrective downzoning will likely to be ruled a taking. And we know how expensive that is. This is the wrong solution. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Bernstein. I would like to clap loudly for the previous statements, which are so well expressed and the emotions and the understanding from years of living in Bloomington, understand the dangers of the plex uh, blanketing of the city of Bloomington. I'm an active citizen of Bloomington committed to the equal treatment and opportunity for, for people of all backgrounds and persuasions. I'm among people who moved near the campus because my husband taught there. He no longer works there, but does go there um, sometimes to the art studio on campus. But now I work as a volunteer for the art museum, although for now from home. Our neighbors walk and bike to campus and downtown, not only for work, but also for all the wonderful cultural sporting and social events of this town. Oh, God. The, the realtors of Bloomington uh, have two markets, in my opinion. Young people who come to live here for four or more years and younger families, I, did I say two? There are many more, sorry. Um, and one of the big markets is the retirement community. Our neighborhood has many people who have come to Bloomington to retire and live here because of this great walkability to downtown and campus. If we, I'm gonna say crowd our neighborhoods and inject lifestyles that are not compatible together, then 
some of the people who have enjoyed raising their children here safely and older people who want a very peaceful and somewhat quiet home and neighborhood may be turned off and leave. And a lot of, of these younger people are sometimes good neighbors, but at the moment we don't actually have the physical space to put them. And if we insert plexes of various sizes in between the existing houses, then the physical and social and emotional closeness of neighbors will be affected. So I'm very sad that as a citizen who's put years of energy teaching our children and adults um, and working with lots of families professionally and just enjoying each other as neighbors. I feel incredibly disrespected in the process that we have just endured for the last few meetings. It has been extremely disappointing and distressing. And I have to say that I am very perplexed and I hope that there will be respect for the longtime Bloomington citizens who have helped define this community, that we can be respected so that the character of the town in which we live and our very neighborhoods is not undone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Deborah Meyerson. Hello, um, my name is Deborah Meyerson. Um, I want to just say I am so proud of the Plan Commission's approval of the text amendments that start the removal of exclusionary zoning to allow duplexes by right. I'm an urban planner. I've worked in the field of housing community development for over 25 years, focusing on case studies that examine how communities around the country have built affordable and mixed income housing. Maintaining single family exclusive neighborhoods is troubling from a social justice standpoint, as well as problematic from a housing market angle, since the status quo artificially limits the supply to allow the most expensive type of home. As we all know, Bloomington needs more housing and has affordability challenges as evidenced by numerous studies, the Bloomington housing study, the ROI housing study, HAMS consolidated plan of 2020 to 2024, at least three city task forces over the last 25 years to look at the problem of affordable housing. Skyrocketing equity is a windfall for current homeowners, but it is also evidence that the market is stifled by limited supply. Allowing plexes simply re-legalizes the housing diversity that neighborhoods have historically had before the advent of exclusionary zoning. Walkable neighborhoods should not be a premium only for the wealthy, but that is what is increasingly happening in the current market. Allowing plexes is a critical component of increasing housing stock in Bloomington. While this will not necessarily improve affordable housing all by itself, it's an important part of the solution. I wanna just note that today, President Biden's American Jobs Plan, um, there was a briefing statement that kind of explained what was in it. I wanna just note that this move is right in tune with the Jobs Plan includes eliminate exclusionary zoning and harmful land use policies. And I won't read the whole thing, but I encourage you to take a look and know that we are right in tune with where the national leadership is taking us. The reporting requirement discussed early this evening by the Plan Commission is the perfect way to monitor the impact. This will provide the information the community needs to readily evaluate where we stand. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Murray. Thank you. Um, I say vote no on the plexus at this time. The plexus must be removed from the residential zoning code. Um, the controls that are necessary are not here. Um, what this does is it amounts to allowing multifamily housing in every neighborhood in Bloomington. 
not just the core neighborhood. Um, it's an extremely radical change in permitted uses. Um, I feel that Lexus by right, it's a total deregulation of housing development in, in, in Bloomington. They will make multifamily housing the default choice in the core neighborhood. The pro proliferation of rental housing will deny home ownership to families who will not be able to compete against deep, top, deep pocket developers buying up anything that comes onto the market. Property values will skyrocket. Um, in my 29 year residence in Bloomington, I've never seen rents decline, not even with the construction of thousands of new apartments and hundreds of new homes. The price of housing continues to rise year after year. You say we need more. At what magic number of units does the trend turn downward? Please vote no on the plexes at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Just a second. Chris Sturbaum. Yes. Yeah, this statement is not aimed at you on the plan commission. You've already demonstrated your unwillingness to consider the thoughtful input from longtime community members of all levels of experience and their sincere concern for Bloomington's future. This message is really for the general public, the media, and city council members who will have to work on this when this is through. I think the most important theme is about the fact that this upzoning proposal is just not ready for passage. It is so broad and so careless that its potential for unintended consequences is both predictable and inevitable. This careless by right rule allows both the cozy little bit one bedroom, two bedroom duplex, while at the same time okaying the six bedroom rent by the room monster popping up next door without even a hearing. And the parking allowance would only be one parking space for that six bedroom monster, whether there's any parking available or anyone has any off street parking at all. Many of these blocks in these little neighborhoods have no off street parking whatsoever. What I've learned about planning is when you open the door to let in the good dogs, the bad dogs come through the same door if it's left wide open. This is libertarian zoning, which believes that less is more. Get the government out of the way, the market will solve our problems if we just let it. Experience has taught me that this is really not so. Have you noticed there are no developers or realtors speaking up about this upzoning? Does that tell you something about the potential winners and losers in this debate? And really the saddest thing is everyone has forgotten about the ADUs. This is something the community really agrees on. It's a way to raise density, increase density without harming single family home, homeowners, without raising the price of homes and helping people buy a house. They can duplex with an ADU, it's simple. It's by right. And it keeps the monster from being unleashed when you want to have gentle increase of zoning. Why ignore this method for density we all agree on? Why push for the most radical and controversial solution instead? The zoning regulation is simply not ripe. I looked up the legal description of ripe. A claim is not ripe for adjudication if it rests upon contingent future events that may not occur as anticipated or indeed may not occur at all. The IU drop in, in occupancy, our historical experience that tells us this won't work as expected. The new data, Margaret Clements has certified and your planners haven't spoken up about that yet, that there were 4,000 approved plus plus more, plus more in the county. And all the studies that get quoted, while they talk about affordable housing needs, they also strongly talk about the great need of housing to buy, which is 
this is actually negative, negatively affected by this rentrification plan. Housing to buy is not funded well and only discussed as an afterthought by our planners. It would be totally irresponsible of the city council to support such a dangerous and carelessly conceived proposal. I need to drive this home. We know there are places where these housing types are appropriate. It was spelled out in the comprehensive plan. We agree and want to work together to do this right. But to jump from a point of agreement to allowing duplexes everywhere and anywhere by right is a blind, careless, and thoughtless jump, especially when the elders of the community are so loudly advising this is a bad idea, will have negative consequences on the community. The city has done this before with disastrous results. This was the first, this was the most, is the most radical zoning change since the last time the city upzoned residential property with the best of intentions, by the way. Tommy Allison, the mayor who spoke earlier, she fought to roll back the previous up zoning, and she's here telling you, don't make the same mistake again. I'm here to remind the city council they have a responsibility to be a check on an irresponsible administration, a reckless plan commission that is carelessly proposing a poorly thought out experiment of radical change to our city code that we can clearly see will not work out as planned and it will not have the, the results desired. We've seen it, we've watched it. Instead of helping in other cities, it has had a negative effect on affordable housing. Like urban renewal, upzoning is a planning idea du jour. Jane Jacobs is turning over in her grave. She called planning a pseudoscience of bloodletting. And she said, observe the city with your own eyes. See what's happening in front of you. We have tried in all Your sincerity. Time is up. Thank you. We Thank tried you. to reach the plan commission. We hope the council Betty can Rose stop Nagel. the madness. Good evening. Thank you for giving me. My name is Betty Rose Nagel. I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, you on the planning commission have heard the arguments against, and so I won't repeat them or add any to them, except to say that it is very, very odd to see progressives, both nationally and in Bloomington, so vigorously supporting deregulation and market forces. If I really thought there would be no unintended consequences, I would say, sure, go ahead and experiment with the core neighborhoods. But really, I think there will be unintended consequences, except you all, having been warned, will eventually not be able to claim that they are unintended or unexpected. Thank you for listening. Vote against, please. Thank you. Jess? Hi, my name is Jessica Griffin. Uh, thank you for helping Bloomington lead the way on um, this kind of incremental change is just really important. Um, I want to note, I hadn't heard of the um, idea of re reporting requirements until earlier in this meeting, and I hope you'll consider that um, to incorporate that later. Um, sometimes I cr criticize Bloomington for its uh, politically conservative tendencies. So having a progressive policy come through just feels really refreshing, um, even though it's probably going to take years to really see an impact from this. It seems that every week I read news stories about cities all over the country improving their zoning laws and ending exclusionary practices. And I'm really excited that we're on our way to join those ranks um, and using this tool in our housing toolbox. Um, like some other people have mentioned, it's not going to solve um, our housing crisis, but we've got to use all the tools that we have. So I'm really thankful for Planning Commission taking the time um, to address uh, the policy change. Thank you. Thank Richard you. Durison. Uh, hi, my name is Richard Durison. Uh, I've been a homeowner in Elm Heights for 35 years. Petition 0921, as amended, represents a huge experimental surgery on the heart of the city. This, could be a this would be a radical deregulation 
that sets the free market loose on the single family housing left in the core neighborhoods. Um, my next statements are a bit political. How often has letting the free market reign led to equity, affordability, and diversity? I think those who argue for this, who consider themselves progressive, are being bamboozled by developer interests. I predict a rapid disappearance of single family housing and home ownership in Bloomington's core. And I am not reassured by any whereas clauses as suggested, although I appreciate the spirit of them. So I argue that you vote no on 0921. Thank you. Thank you. Who do we have next, Jackie? Sorry about that. Uh, we have Peter. Hi, Peter Dorfman from the near west side. I hadn't actually intended to speak tonight. I, I am sort of talked out on this subject. And I also strongly suspect that this ship has sailed. Um, but I, I, there are a few things that I haven't heard yet. So I'm going to say them. Um, I disagree with the assessments we've been hearing of who's going to build all these plexes. With due respect, upzoning advocates are in sad or cynical denial about the attractiveness of the core of Bloomington to out of town developers. There's ample evidence that Bloomington is exactly what national scale developers are looking for. If advocates will just open their eyes and read a little bit about what's going on in the real estate industry. Private equity firms have hundreds of billions of dollars to invest, and developers announce their intentions in their own trade press every day. It's all out there in public. We're hearing a lot of wishful thinking about local developers stepping up and building lots of plexes. But meanwhile, we're offered reassurance that this is going to develop slowly in piecemeal fashion. I hear a contradiction. If we're going to get a trickle of new locally developed plexes, how is this supposed to have the impact on housing affordability that the administration is promising us? Planners tell us the fact that we have only a handful of new ADUs is evidence that plex development will be similarly slow. They're ignoring the fact that corporate developers are not interested in ADUs because of the owner occupation requirement. Indiana state law forbids cities from requiring owner, owner occupation for plexes, which makes them very attractive to developers. We don't have a lot of ADUs because financing them is hard. Not many homeowners are up to it. The rationalizations about walkability to downtown ignore the common sense advice that's right there in the city's own comprehensive plan. Bloomington should not be obsessively concentrating development around the downtown square. It should be developing in multiple walkable village nodes with amenities that make them self-sufficient and reduce the focus on developing downtown. Witness the success of the South Dunn Street development and the retail node at Henderson and Hillside. That's a model that should be replicated all over the city. A lot of justifications for duplexing demonstrated a basic misunderstanding of what can already be done under current law with an attached ADU basically a duplex with the owner living in one of the units. That's exactly what advocates during these hearings have told us they want homeowners to be able to create, but they don't seem to realize that they can already do that. Lastly, advocates are laboring under a misconception about the reversibility of this policy. Once we open this door, we will never close it again. We've been hearing about periodic reporting, which is a sexy idea, but we have no idea how the planners would monitor the results of eliminating single family zoning or what they would recognize as a problem. We have no idea how big an influx of newplex development would trigger concern on the part of the administration. We have no idea what action the administration would take if out of town developers did rush in and buy up the scarce affordable houses in the core. And if they did, and the city tried to, cap, uh, tried to put a cap on plex development or reinstate single family zoning, developers' lawsuits would break the city. 
There's no going back from this change. And the mayor needs to throw out his three ring binder and stop kidding us about this. I urge you to oppose this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Jean? Hi, this is Jean Simonian. You know, I, I like houses. I think many people in Bloomington do. I like everything about planning and building and styling and living in houses. Pre-COVID, when life still seemed normal, I liked going to open houses just to look. I used to spend hours as a kid building entire neighborhoods out of Legos. Like many, I grew up in a house. My parents, like so many of their generation in the 50s, lived in a city apartment for a few years. But by the time my older brother was a toddler and my mother was pregnant with me, the time had come and my parents bought their first and only home. You know, it, it was a time of neighborhood building across the country. So there were other young families on the block. There were also older homes, Victorians, that sat at the ends of long gravel drives into deep woods. When I returned to my parents' home after my father's death to ready the house for sale, not much had changed. The same houses were still standing. A number had been expanded, adding a story or a room. The rising property values freed up money for expansion, and families seemed to need more space than I remember needing as a child. The market then for housing was tight. Demand was very high, even for these unmodern houses. And the, the house sold in a couple of weeks to a young couple. When I felt the time was right for me to uh, find a house for myself, I looked in within my budget and that led me to core neighborhoods. I've since learned such houses have a name, naturally occurring affordable housing. I just thought they were old houses. The house I chose sat on a busier street than I liked and it needed cosmetic updates, but it was solid and it gifted me with the hardwood floors and plaster walls and woodwork that replicated in newer construction would have been completely unaffordable for me. Buying requires a leap of faith along with the cold calculations of finance. There is an unspoken covenant when buying an older home. Like joining a dialogue, the conversation preceded you and it should continue beyond you. There's also a covenant between a city and its citizens that the city will not cause undue harm to its citizens' opportunities for independence, financial stability, and security that home ownership can best provide. We should be thankful for the housing stock we have. We should protect it, learn its acquired over time lessons of diversity, density, and environmental stewardship. We should replicate this Bloomington model, not squander it merely to provide more market rate rental housing. Don't give away the next generation's chance to prosper. Thank you. Thank you. Dee Weaver. You should be able to talk. Mr. Weaver, are you there? Okay. 
Moving on. Kathy Crabtree. Hi, um, I'm Kathy Crabtree. Um, and as I've mentioned um, at the earlier meetings, I live in the near west side and I'm a homeowner and um, have lived in Bloomington for over 30 years, both as a renter and as a homeowner. Um, I am really grateful to both city planning staff as well as the plan commission. I was have been very impressed with um, your thoughtfulness in your comments and it's been very obvious that you've done a lot of research around this and that you take your job seriously. And I'm really grateful that you are supporting Bloomington in moving forward with the rest of the country in um, more inclusionary zoning. So um, I just want to encourage you to um, support this, go ahead and vote to support this. And thank you so much for your time and for um, allowing the opportunity for me to have more neighbors in the near west side. Carrie Thompson. Hi, I'm Carrie Thompson and uh, appreciate all your work on um, these various amendments. Um, I am here, I understand you're probably gonna vote for this amendment, but I am here to uh, voice my disappointment in this amendment. Um, plexus can be a tool to create affordable housing and indeed will naturally densify neighborhoods. However, unmitigated, they will cause a landslide in housing prices uh, that will skyrocket um, just by creating a demand uh, for to turn these single family homes into uh, plexes. And I think that we are really missing an opportunity to create genuine affordable housing and workforce housing in our city. And if we miss the mark now, it's gonna be very hard to go back and put those conditions on. One thing that the, um, the uh, plan commission and others have stated is that this is an experiment to see how this goes. And I would say that uh, we have another experiment going on uh, with the expansion of the student zone, uh, the new, newly identified student zone in the map that you'll look at later. These plexes are really going to be student rentals. Um, and I love living in a city with, um, with students. And I also know that we have lots of student housing already with more on the horizon. If we want to diversify our neighborhoods, if we want to offer people in the workforce and people who need uh, affordable housing, good places to live, these plexes need conditions on them in order to mitigate the skyrocketing prices. I really urge you to vote no on this amendment. And more importantly, I encourage the public who is listening today who may, uh, may not have spoken up yet to write to their city council members. Um, we know that this amendment will pass tonight um, and the next step is city council. And I think our city needs to come together and thoughtfully create solutions that will indeed increase our workforce housing and our affordable housing so that we can be a more welcoming community um, to people other than the rich and the students. Thank you for your time. Sarah Copper. Hi, my name is Sarah Copper and I'm a homeowner in the Elm Heights neighborhood and a former renter in the Bryan Park neighborhood. Um, I just want to urge you to vote yes on the proposal. I, uh, when we were looking for housing about five years ago, I was astonished by how expensive it was to live in a poor neighborhood. And as we are a family without a car, we really needed to live where we could walk or bike. And we were fortunate enough to be able to find a place, but every year it's getting less and less affordable to live in a core neighborhood. And at the time we were looking, we would have loved to have a duplex option, a townhome option, a triplex option that would have made it more affordable for our young family 
to stay in the core neighborhood. And I feel really fortunate that we were able to find a place, but I would like to make it more accessible for even more people to have more options of types of housing in walkable, bikeable neighborhoods. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Jeff Richardson. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, Bloomington city officials uh, elected and appointed have been asked quite often why they aren't looking more closely at college towns that are somewhat comparable to Bloomington, such as Ann Arbor, West Lafayette, Iowa City, and others, rather than uh, relying so heavily on Minneapolis. Uh, while there are, uh, there are some suggestions that this may happen, to my knowledge, it has not. Uh, I'm sure there is much more to learn about Ann Arbor and other college towns uh, somewhat similar to Bloomington. So I was surprised to hear Commissioner Kinsey uh, mention at Monday's Plan Commission meeting that uh, she understood that plexes were allowed everywhere in Ann Arbor and Chapel Hill. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> so I went ahead after her statement, I decided to follow up with my, some of my uh, housing contacts in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, the information that I'm about to share with you comes from Joan Lowenstein, a former Ann Arbor City Council member and member of the Ann Arbor Downtown Development Authority and Joel Batterman, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan in urban planning. And uh, he also lectures at Wayne State University in urban studies and, and planning. So I communicated with both of them just two days ago. So here's the situation in Ann, Ann Arbor now. Uh, for the historic uh, single family neighborhoods, the, no plexes are allowed. That's, that's the current situation. Uh, with ADUs, uh, they just uh, had a meeting on February 9th uh, where they, uh, the plan commission uh, initially reviewed a, a new ADU uh, uh, proposal and where owners will be allowed to build new detached ADUs on their properties. And um, this was uh, passed eventually by the uh, plan commission and now it's before the city council. Uh, they also, at that same meeting, February 9th, uh, they have approved, uh, they reviewed, I should say, a new transit overlay district called T1 for denser mixed use development along transit corridors. Uh, this too now has gone through the plan commission and is pending approval with the city council. Uh, I, I mention this because this is illustrative of the, and they're doing some exciting work on affordable housing and, uh, and some other plans that I'm, I'm gonna sh send to you directly in an email. But um, there's a lot going on in these college towns, a lot we can learn. And I wish we would focus more on those than um, on some of these other cities like Minneapolis, Portland, or Seattle. Uh, finally, I'd like to just support what Tommy Allison said in her comments, and uh, I'm glad, so glad she's still so engaged in, in the city that uh, she loves and, and we love her. Uh, Dave Warren always eloquently makes his case for upzoning, but at the end of the three times I've heard him speak, he mentions that uh, we are going to really see the benefits of that for our children and, and, and grandchildren. And um, we'll see, that may be the case. But in the meantime, there's some actual, real tangible things that the city can do uh, with affordable housing because they presented this as an urgent matter, urgent. So if it's urgent, waiting 15 to 20 years might be good for some, but others would like to see some plans that might uh, come to fruition, let's say in the next three to five years. There's an excellent opportunity to do that with a hospital property. The city owns that property. There was some hesitation at the last uh, uh, meeting that I attended whether the city might in fact uh, embark upon looking at or considering putting affordable housing there. But there's a real example, a real tangible example of where the city can take action. I hope the plan department, the plan commission and the mayor will also come forth with some very specific affordable housing plans that we can see results in the next three to five years to respond to this urgent need uh, that uh, the mayor and others have advanced. I wanna thank everyone uh, on all sides uh, for making their best cases uh, tonight in a very civil, calm way. Um, I, that for me is also important that we, uh, we advance um, uh, what is best for the city in, 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 in respect and, and dignity uh, for um, who we are 
and, and the city we all love. I look forward to pursuing this with the city council. I would ask you to vote no on this and uh, hope that we can continue this important debate. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next, Jackie? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Ed Bernstein. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, There's a bit of an echo if, if you're near Wendy. Wendy, turn your thing off. Um, my wife and I have lived here for 29 years. Um, we lived in the same house, which we could afford on an art professor's salary because it was a wreck. We have spent the ensuing years f fixing it up, have no intention of leaving until moving to the, quote, funny farm. We love Bloomington and our neighborhood, which is a mixture of wonderful older houses like ours built in 1941, also contains duplexes. We have a rental next door. We have B&Bs and a large com uh, apartment complex. We have a mixture of every age, family type group, as well as young people and students. Upzoning in this core neighborhood to achieve what I call, quote, proper density and possible affording, affordable housing reminds me of Ronald Reagan's trickle down economics in the 1980s. Tax breaks to the rich that would eventually trickle down to the average American and create wealth for everybody. You know what happened with that. I feel the current upzoning plan has the same false thinking. Building plexes in the core neighborhoods and at some future point, which was just mentioned by Jeff, you may achieve the needed density and affordable housing stock. As one member of the city council pointed out in a presentation at the synagogue, this will happen in the future, in my grandchildren's generation. By then the core neighborhoods will cease to exist and our beloved Bloomington um, will, be, will cease to exist. Hang on. Uh, Sorry. The data the Planning Commission used, used doesn't seem to reflect the unknown changes post-COVID. Indeed, many of the public comments and statistics contradict what, that, what you all have presented. Seems to many that it would be better to temporarily stop this process and, and since we understand the commission uh, and stop this process and just, you know, look and try to get uh, more data. I feel that this, this issue has become a generational, often acrimonious divide among our citizens. The older generation has often been depicted as non-caring NIMBYs, wanting to prefer, pre preserve the status quo and even racist. We do not object to the idea of plexus, but worried that by right permission will negatively impact the cause while indeed not uh, creating uh, fam affordable housing. Many long-term residents of Bloomington remember that the core neighborhoods were almost destroyed by permitting un unlimited rentals. Both Tommy Allison and Charlotte Zietlow and others attested this to the common plannings that we've had over the past weeks. However, this historical knowledge by older residents seemed to be irrelevant. History does repeat itself and we could lose what is special about Bloomington. Please vote no on this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, let's try Dee Weaver again. She's away. I think we can hear you. Mr. Weaver? No, I don't hear you. Let's try Pam Weaver. Pam, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna let Dave just Perfect. talk on my computer. Thank you. <laughs> it just seems okay. to be malfunctioning. And then I'll see, I can talk as well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dave Weaver, longtime Bloomington resident. Um, before I really sit, 
say my comments, I'd like to respectfully ask a couple of things of the audience, irrespective of your opinion on this topic. One is to please really listen. Don't just wait until you decide if I agree with you or not. And if not, stop listening for understanding. And also be self-aware. Notice your heart rate, your breathing, your emotional responses. Consider where these are really coming from and try to remain calm so you can listen. Okay, here are my thoughts. Listening to the comments on this call, the one last week, and through the course of many hours of UDO-related council meetings over the past couple of years, I've been struck by all the stories and personal background people offer as lead-ins to their objections to planned increases in housing density in Bloomington's core neighborhoods. What do most of the preambles have in common? They are generally stories about how the speaker has worked to help those less fortunate, or perhaps the speaker was less fortunate in the past and worked their way up, or perhaps they lived in the neighborhood for many years because it was all they could afford 40 years ago. The themes are very clear. The bulk of those opposed to higher density are well-educated, well-traveled, financially stable, and socially quite liberal. They support helping others. They support things like public education, public infrastructure, libraries, homeless initiatives, needle exchange programs, Habitat for Humanity, adoption, et cetera, et cetera. All seem genuine when these stories are told. And then comes the but, followed by vehement opposition to greater density. Why are these things connected? Why share all that background? I think it's because the speakers are generally selfless people and they want to make sure others know this before they offer what is fundamentally a selfish opinion. They may also be telling themselves the same thing to rationalize an opinion out of step with their true selves because a selfless preamble shouldn't be followed by a but. It should be followed by an and, which can't logically be followed by opposition. I suggest that now might be a good time to notice this. How do you square this discrepancy of philosophies with your statements? Finally, I've heard all the rhetoric around how the neighborhoods will be ruined by outside developers and monster plexes on every block. These are unfounded. The UDO has many safeguards in place to prevent this. Please take time to read it if you haven't. I've heard people talk about how north of campus was ruined years ago in the same way. Mistakes were definitely made and the city learned from that mistake so it won't happen again. Will the neighborhoods change? Certainly. Will they change overnight? Of course not. Will the changes be bad? It's up to us. Will we embrace newcomers, make room for them, and appreciate how much they have to offer, even if they're different from us? Or will we build a big, beautiful bureaucratic wall around our core neighborhoods and miss out on a chance to help contribute to solutions? To get to know more interesting people, to see kids riding bikes, to help a new neighbor shovel snow. The choice is up to us. Embrace the future or hold on to the past to our own collective detriment. Please approve the amended proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Should I just go ahead? Yes, Pam, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so Pam Weaver here, um, spouse of former speaker. Um, I, uh, I've, I've listened to a lot of opposition about the upzoning of the core neighborhoods, and I've heard a lot of those opposing speak of a lack of cooperation. And I just, I just wanna share a different point of view. Um, over the past several years that I've been actively participating in this question, I've actually seen the opposite happen. Um, first of all, there've been hours and hours of opportunities for people to voice their concerns and ideas, um, starting with neighborhood meetings with with, which I would attend and which very few people would attend, actually. Um, there have been online forums. There was uh, open mic and council chamber pre-pandemic and now over Zoom. I mean, lots of time to offer opinions. So I, I don't think that there's been any lack of cooperation there. The department, the planning department has also offered lots of upzoning options over those years. ADUs have been favorably mentioned earlier in this meeting, but actually when those were first introduced, um, they were, they were, people fought against those just as vehemently as they're fighting against these changes. Um, 
after like a lot of advocacy um, made them be enacted anyway, it turned out that they didn't result in radical destabilization of the core neighborhoods the way everybody, I mean, literally the same words were spoken um, and it did not destabilize, destabilize the core neighborhoods. And now they're being, being held up as like the greatest thing. Um, another time there was a pro proposal made that duplexes be allowed only on the corners. And I, on my listserv anyway, I mean, there were so these same comments, exact same comments made by the exact same people. And did we know how many corners there were? Did we know how much traffic there was gonna be? So that wasn't even moved forward. And meanwhile, that would have had the effect of naturally limiting the number of plexes in the neighborhoods, which is something that was mentioned at the last meeting as being so important to these folks. So just recently, um, I watched the planning department respond to comments about the new proposed R4 map. I mean, it, the second one was significantly slashed in terms of the number of lots that they were pro proposing to be R4. And even that is not sufficient. And so it seems to be a just say no policy with this. Um, no matter what folks who want to see some upzoning say, it seems that there it's just say no, don't offer options, just say no. It's like the gun rights people who say, you know, don't start with the automatic, the, the semiotic, whatever. I don't even know what guns do, but don't don't disallow any kind of gun because they're gonna take away all your guns. I mean, it's a sort of a similar effect in my opinion. Um, so no meet in the middle suggestions are made. Um, I feel pretty comfortable that lots of homeowners in the core neighborhoods are not gonna be willing to sell their homes to outside developers. I think that will limit it. And I've heard tonight the mention of providing good ongoing reporting. Um, I'm satisfied that this commission, as well as the city council, will step in and slow down development if in fact we see our core neighborhoods being overtaken by outside development. So I would say, please vote yes to this amended proposal and let's trust our process going forward to make sure it doesn't ruin our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Clements. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great, good evening everyone. I appreciate all the time everyone is putting into this important issue and it is a very heartfelt issue because it involves uh, the lives, the livelihoods and the financial security of our neighbors. And uh, that being said, I'm a little bit disappointed in the process. The previous speaker asked us to trust the process and that's the very thing that has shaken us to our bones. The process is not being respected. The comprehensive plan is not being respected. Uh, request to kind of slow down and get some good data and look at this after the census is in and after uh, we know the, more fully the full effects of COVID. Let's just slow down a bit and, and think about this more fully. Well, we, you know, we have strong reason to not trust the process. So I'm here to give a message to Bloomington. Wake up, Bloomington. Your city is well into an experimental phase based on nothing more than an extrapolation of an unverified speculation. The city has asserted needs for more housing, more affordable housing, and yet it continues to fill some other need. In addition, earlier today, we heard someone speculate that there are 36,000 people who work in town but don't live here. He stated that these 36,000 people would probably live in the city if they could. The problem is they don't want to live in multifamily housing and that's all the city is building. And furthermore, that's all they are planning to build. We have a plethora of the wrong kind of housing. The city is either not keeping count nor sharing honest data with its constituents. Finally, those 36,000 people cannot afford the tax burden you would saddle them with for all of your speculation on their wants and the fulfillments of all your needs and the needs of everyone around you. They just can't 
They can't live like that. They don't make enough money. They can't afford your values. For those of you who honestly care about the environment, you need to ask, why is there such sprawl? It's because the planners won't listen to their community. People don't want to live in the community you envision for them. They don't want to live the lifestyle that you envision for them. They have their own vision and they will go further and further away to obtain it. I ask the, the city of Bloomington to write to your city council. This is an emergency. If you care about the workforce housing, affordable housing or the climate, you need to get involved. I'd like to reiterate some statistics. The ROI study asserted that there would be a need for somewhere close to 5,200, actually a little bit under 5,200 uh, uh, housing units by the year 2030. Since that report was published, we, as an underestimate, we have built 4,098 multifamily housing units. That doesn't include the 123 at McDowell Gardens. It doesn't include the hospital site. It doesn't include the stuff over there by Switchyard, y'all are planning. It doesn't include the site at Hillside in Huntington. It doesn't include the warehouse they're marketing for development behind Carlisle. And it doesn't include the Latimer Square uh, a property that's under discussion right now for development. Wake up, Bloomington. They're building multifamily housing more and more, and that's not what we want or what they claim we need. Wake up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard Lewis. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Lewis, and I would like to thank you all for your time and commitment during this process and for uh, your public service. I'm gonna uh, angle away from my prepared remarks for just a moment because I I will say that as, as a liberal and as someone who considers himself progressive on a lot of issues, I have to say this is the first time that I've been compared or that people like me have been compared to the NRA. Um, there have been charges of racism and elitism during this process. And I find that one of the very regrettable things about this, that, that progressives are sort of eating their own. We are largely a democratic uh, capital D city and, um, it's a shame that we can't actually talk about policy issues without calling one another names. And I place some of this at, at the feet of the administration who did not engage with the community at the outset of this process. There, as, as Kerry Thompson and others have pointed out, there could have been conversations with uh, neighborhoods, with thought leaders at the very beginning to inform this. Um, it started out as a heavy handed top down approach. I think the planning department was caught in the middle of that because they were required to come up with a, a very big R4 map and, and then had to backpedal from that based on public comment. So I, 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 I know that there, are, there has been input since then, but I believe the onset of this process was flawed. And I think that's what a lot of people have mentioned or tried to mention. And I will say, I'm speaking to the commission members tonight with um, a great deal of disappointment. I'm disappointed that a majority of commission members approved amendments the other night to remove any conditions or safeguards against the introduction of plexes into the core neighborhoods. This goes against the recommendations of planning staff themselves and squarely against the many references in the comprehensive plan to preserve the core neighborhoods and to not overpressure them with added density. It also goes against the recent practices established with ADUs. A two-year conditional period is not an overburden either to staff or to the public. It allows the introduction of, could allow the introduction of plexes at a reasonable rate so that they are closely monitored. And I'm sorry that those safeguards were just sort of blown off the rails. I'm disappointed that commission members talk very generally about the need for more housing in Bloomington in general, then acknowledge that these plexes will not necessarily provide an affordable housing solution, but then also say we have to do something and then one of the members also said, and if we're gonna do it, let's go all in. Um, I, I find it disappointing and I don't think that's the right solution. I'm disappointed the plan commission members have not taken the time in their own comments to respond to very specific and well thought out comments by community leaders such as uh, former mayor Tommy Allison or Kerry Thompson who has spoken I think three times recently. 
and who in her role with Habitat helped build probably more affordable units than anyone else in town, and who point by point illuminated the problems with applying plexes as an affordable housing solution for those at workforce income levels and below. I'm disappointed that the commission is not following the comprehensive plan recommendations to develop density at the fringes of the core neighborhoods and on available law, land along the arterial streets, which uh, puts would add density near public transportation and still in within very close reach of the downtown and other uh, neighborhood nucleus uh, points. I'm disappointed that the commission tacitly endorses the idea that Reaganomics trickle down theories applied to housing will somehow be successful, that more affluent people will move into the shiny new market rate housing, leaving the housing crumbs, which may or may not be affordable in a college town to the less affluent. Not only is this, I find a shockingly elitist notion, but how is it the progressives are espousing a discredited conservative economic policy? Where is our knowledge of recent, recent economic history? I'm disappointed that the commission does not acknowledge that the market itself will not on its own create affordability. We need a much more holistic plan that includes incentives, subsidies and grants for developers to be able to develop truly affordable units. This was also mentioned by Kerry Thompson and others, and it points to the reasoning of the Go Farther Together group to enact a pause that would help us as an entire community to build a much better series of programs that are truly affordable from, from the ground up. I ask the commission members to please vote against petition Z0921 in its current form. Thank you for your time. Thank you. MHC. Uh, hello, um, my name is Sarah Kathleen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, although it's, it is difficult, as everyone has said, it does feel like no one is listening to each other or that everyone believes that what they are saying is true. Um, seems appropriate for the year we've had, but uh, I have a little prepared statement I'd like to read. Um, I was lucky enough to purchase a house in the Waterman neighborhood in 2016 the last year that houses were actually affordable in Bloomington. As a low income buyer, I was also lucky enough to be able to access the first time home buyer assistance program through the housing opportunity program in Indianapolis and also the city's hand funding to purchase my house. I have heard several people here say that there are affordable houses in the core and I'm confused because that is not true at all. It makes me assume that people don't actually understand what affordable means. In this current housing market, I would be unable to purchase a house in the entire county and definitely not the city with the budget that I have. Single family homes are the most expensive option on the market. Duplexes are cheaper. It's a simple fact. I've heard many people here arguing that home buying is important to them. Well, a duplex is a home. Many of my friends who have income levels similar to me are unable to buy a home in the current market. I know they will be excited to be able to buy an affordable home, potentially in a neighborhood that before would not be an option, that before the option of a duplex would be impossible. I'll use this moment to remind everyone here that according to the US Census, the poverty rate for children under five in Bloomington is 37.1%. I quickly searched other college towns and I cannot comment on their housing affordability, but in a quick search, I can tell you that the poverty rate for children under five in Ann Arbor is 10.3%. Again, we have 37.1%. In West Lafayette, it is 21.8%. In Madison, Wisconsin, it is 16.6%. And I use that poverty rate for children under five because it excludes university students. So it's pretty evident that we, we, have, a, we have a problem here uh, that is not comparable to a poverty rate in Ann Arbor of 10.3%. We are also dead last in the state for housing and rental affordability. We have the second highest cost of a meal in the entire state in, this, in Monroe County. So we have a lot of work to do and I, I hope that we will use every tool we've got. So I encourage you to allow plexes Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Janice Sorby. Oh, 
Hi, my name is Jan Sorby, and I'm disappointed that this process has been so divisive, and it's already caused damage to our community, I believe. This process did not have to break down into sides. With proper leadership, we could have joined together to find solutions together, but this process did not allow for that. I suspect both sides agree on about 95% of everything, but we have not had the opportunity to come together and to make decisions. What has been passed is dangerous and reckless. You have ignored the best advice of the APA, of the Urban Land Institute, and our very own comprehensive plan to protect Bloomington's most affordable housing. Upping the occupancy from three to six is reckless. Allowing five people was a disaster in the past and nothing has changed. This will be a disaster to allow six. You are passing this experiment without even stating what is the goal of this experiment? What will success look like? What does failure look like? Is 42% owner occupied a good balance for a stable neighborhood? How about 32%, 22? How do we know when it's time to rip that page out of the three ring binder? You have focused on the core, less than 4% of the city. Your legislation does nothing, nothing to touch the neighborhoods that were born under the racist covenant. This is not true for the core. The core was built for everyone, but yet you focus on the core. Until you do something about those neighborhoods that were born under a racist covenant, I say vote no. There should not be losers and winners, but just good places to live. I own a fourplex. I believe in duplexes, fourplexes, townhouses, ADUs, and yes, single family housing too. I resent, really resent being put into um, the camp where people assume I'm against plexus. Please contact your city council representative if you are interested in this discussion. This will affect every single person in the city of Bloomington. We need to come together. We need to figure out how to find and make and protect affordable housing so everyone has a place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria Witt. Okay, now I can work. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Victoria Witt. Can you hear me now? We can, yes, thank you. Oh, good, good. Well, I understand and I really believe that you all have taken a great deal of time on this plan and I appreciate all of that, I truly do. However, I hope that you have been really listening to all the people asking you to take a pass on these amendments. Uh, their advice is based on experience, and it makes a great deal of sense. This is a reckless move, and I feel certain that it will have very negative consequences. Um, please listen and thoughtfully consider the comments asking you to vote no on these amendments. Thank you. Venley. Hello. Hello. Um, Hi. my name is my name is Wendy Brisht. And um thank you for giving me time to speak. Um while I, I do understand the good intentions of all the commission and everyone involved, um I'm also increasingly saddened. Uh, by the level of the lack of understanding almost amounting to ignorance of Bloomington zoning history. Um, in 2019, I, I used the quote, those who refuse to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And it's painfully appropriate here. What I'm hearing is 
the wisdom of experienced Bloomington leaders, our former mayors, those who have lived in and experienced Bloomington's housing history, as I have, and special housing problems for decades, they're being ignored or dismissed in favor of urban ideology from young people who don't have the experience and understanding of this Bloomington's special problems that the longtime residents do. We've experienced it. Uh, their plans are not supported by facts in this town. And the history of Bloomington must be considered and the previous consequences of zoning taken into account. Despite what Mr. Warren stated, the most expensive housing type is not a single family home. It is a student rental duplex that rents for $3,500 to $4,000 a month. That is the competition that will drive up the cost of housing to buy. Duplexes will not be built to sell. They will be built to rent and they will not rent cheaply and they will rent to students. There are a large number of rental houses in Bloomington. If those landlords are not selling their rentals, it's because they are lucrative investments. To assume those investors will convert their investments to, to more lucrative duplexes and then sell them is not rational. My research has also shown me that housing areas across the country close to large university campuses either have strict zoning protection or they inevitably revert to student housing. Is that what you really want for our neighborhoods? It's not what our residents want. They don't want urban density. If they wanted that, they would go live in a city. Supply and demand only applies with like housing. I keep saying this, but it never seems to land. More rentals won't touch single family home supply. In fact, they will decrease it. With three of four single family homes in Elm Heights now reverting to student rentals, even under the current zoning, is it, a give, it is a given that with a possibility of doubled rents that will only increase until the student population forces out the current residents, as was the case in the past. Greater density near IU means student rentals. If five unrelated adults turned large areas of Elm Heights into 100% student housing, how can you say that six unrelated adults with much higher demand and profits now will have a different outcome? No one has been able to answer that question for me. I want an answer because there is no logic to this. To repeat the same thing only more so and expect a different outcome is not logical. Once two or three plexes move into a block of families and retirees, the precarious balance will simply be gone. For the first time in a generation, children have returned and are playing in Wiley Street as I did when I was a girl. It was silent for decades. My son's friend from Oxford couldn't find a room in Elm Heights. He looked for four months. There wasn't a room available. Bloomington was number five on the list of the most lucrative and desirable college locations in a publication for real estate rental investors. That was with the current zoning. When the students move into the plexes, the residents will have to move out of town because they won't be moving into the large student apartment buildings that the students will vacate to move closer to campus. Those will be the only affordable housing units that will be left. Recovery took decades. We had, I live on a, in a house, all the other corner houses are rentals. There are rentals all around me. We had drunken knife fights. We had fist fights that spilled into the streets. We have parties every weekend. You have a responsibility to serve our current residents, not just your plans for the neighborhood, but the residents that live there. Um, I think, um, you know, I understand you want to drill for oil. You want to drill for more housing. And, and I understand that and I respect that, but please don't drill in our successful, dense, inclusive neighborhoods. They are beautiful, they are rare, they are vulnerable, and they are fragile. They have come at a cost for the homeowners that have made them places people wanna live. We who have lived there for generations know and understand that this zoning will doom our neighborhoods to be non-inclusive, non-diverse, 100% student housing near the, near the university as it did before and still exists. And the expansion of that non-diverse housing was only stopped by the current zoning protection. Last spring, our houses flooded. Mine flooded three times for days. There was a river flowing through the floor and there wasn't a portable pump left in the city. I had to drive to Indianapolis. There were fountains coming out of the manholes. I'd like to know how you're gonna put greatly increased density and re reduced permeability without upgrading the storm grains. I would like you to make ADUs easier, provide help with financing and permitting and find another solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tom Millen. Um, can you hear me here? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, my name is Tom Millen. Um, I, my family's lived in the Bryan Park neighborhood for over six years now. I oppose the plexes in the core neighborhood. And my concern is that there's not been much done in the way of examining the great impact that's going to be on the infrastructure of the core neighborhoods. Some folks here have touched on it. There's going to be major stresses put upon water, sewer, drainage, 
natural gas pipelines and the local electrical grid, uh, not just uh, roads and sidewalks. So I ask fo folks to uh, vote no on this. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sam Curry. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Sam Curry. Um, I'm a grad student at IU. I wanna express my support uh, for these measures in front of the commission and I hope that the commission will support them. Uh, I believe that these measures will help the city meet the needs of its future. Um, and I wanna agree uh, with some of the people um, who have noted that the nationalization and polarization of the political discourse and references to Reaganomics in the NRA uh, don't fit this conversation very well. And I hope that as this conversation continues, this kind of language will abate. Um, I'm sure that the commission does not find this kind of language very persuasive. And I, to their credit, I think the commission has proven that they're open to being persuaded and listen to um, the voices of their constituents. Um, I, I do know that some members of the Common Council are here tonight, um, and if these measures do pass, and I hope that they will and go to the Council, um, I hope that those members will evaluate them on their merits, um, as I'm sure that they will. Uh, lastly, I just want to say um, that the people who show up to these meetings are not necessarily a representative of the whole community, and I, I do think it is great that people show up to have their voices heard. Um, but it's not necessarily representative of the whole community, and um, it is important that there is, uh, that the council works on behalf of everybody and the community, uh, not just people who are able to make it to these meetings. Um, so thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for your patience, um, and have a good night. Eric? Thank you. My name is Eric Ost. And I'd like to say good evening to the Planning Commission members. And uh, thank you for your thoughtful investment of time and attention and service to our community. I ask that you vote no on petition Z0921 as amended and to forward the petition to the Common Council with no recommendation or an unfavorable recommendation. Many of the proposed UDO changes, and in particular this petition as amended, are promoted to address gaps in housing for members of our community. They do so by codifying a more market-based focus rather than a more community-based focus. In fact, and in effect, the market has naturally led to the creation, perpetuation, and amplification of the gaps in housing affordability that we see in our community and which are of keen concern for so many people. As a direct consequence, this petition as amended will further potentiate the market, but will not produce significantly more affordable housing. In sending acceleration and concentrated creation of duplexes and the follow on securitization of rents will move our community in the wrong direction. Simply increasing the number of market rate rental duplexes will do little to enhance affordable home ownership. Tragically, it will materially shut that door for many people who would like to own their own homes. It is time to take a breath, take stock, and take the necessary steps to construct a future providing housing for all members of our community. For now, I ask that members of the Planning Commission vote no on petition Z0921 as amended and to forward the petition to the Common Council with either no recommendation or with an unfavorable recommendation. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Thank you. Um, before we go on, if you, uh, if you are here and you would like to make public comment, um, we're, we're getting to the end. Uh, there are only a few more hands raised. If there are more uh, who would like to make comment, please go ahead and raise your hand now so we can get a sense of, uh, of how many more speakers there will be. We're gonna need to take a break here at some point. Um, my preference would be to complete public comment before we take a break. Um, but if there are going to be a lot more speakers, we may need to break before the end of comments. So if you would uh, like to make comment, please do raise your hand by uh, clicking on that participants tab or the reactions tab and, and then clicking on the, the raise hand button. And if, uh, if you have any trouble finding that, just send us a, a chat and we'll make sure you get recognized. Thanks. Dave Rollo. 
good evening, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, what is proposed here in this ordinance zero, uh, uh, zero, zero, uh, zero nine to one is the most radical, the most extreme change in zoning that I've witnessed in 30 years of observing plan commission meetings, including my term on the, the commission. What you're effectively doing is permitting, actually encouraging because of the lucrative investment potential, the conversion of single family homes into rentals by permitting them to become duplexes in every Bloomington neighborhood. This is counter to our longstanding goal of owner occupancy. It is counter to the 2018 comprehensive plan, which specifically states, specifically states to not do this. It is counter to affordability, since the most modest homes, starter homes, will offer the greatest profit in the conversion. It is counter to the integrity and cohesion of neighborhoods that are immediately adjacent to IU, already subject to high proportions of rentals. So this change in the UDO to upzone all Bloomington neighborhoods should be rejected this evening. The prudent approach should be in accordance with the comprehensive plan to determine where plexus should be placed along arterials or at prospective village centers and the R4 district map. This is still possible. Reject this extreme and harmful approach to densification. To remove, remove plexus in R1, R2, R3, pending a different approach that invites neighborhoods into the process and adheres to our, your guiding document, the comprehensive plan. Look to the information that Jeff Richardson has provided on Ann Arbor and listen to Tommy Allison, whose administration saved the core neighborhoods decades ago. Thank you. Thank you. Deidre Todd. Deidre, are you there? Yes. There you I'm, go. Okay. I just have one question that I find rather confusing. If in the Elm Heights area, only about 40% of the houses are homeowner owned, why are the rents so high if 60% is rental? It doesn't make sense that the prices will go down if we have more rentals. And most of duplexes, most of plexes will be rentals. The other thing from observing all these meetings and the way people are talking, it seems to me that the biggest problem in Bloomington are our salaries are too low. That there's lots of housing, but people can't afford it because they don't make much money, which is partially because students look for part-time jobs, which I think lowers some salaries. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Russ Skiba. Yes, thank you. My name is Russ Skiba. I'm from Hoosier Acres. I earned my PhD in 1987 and have been a nationally recognized researcher in the area of racial equity for over 25 years. I've worked with others around the country to improve racial equity at the federal and state level and here in Bloomington. So I'm well aware of how much we need to address issues of race and racism in Bloomington. The idea that adding more duplexes throughout the city will somehow address issues of affordability and equity has been a central argument of the administration throughout the debate on this proposal and continues to be argued as such as we near a final vote. There's no question that equity and affordability are critical issues for our community. As we grow and move forward, it is absolutely essential that we provide opportunities for all, however big their paycheck. 
And even more, we must be a community that clearly acknowledges that whether we are old or young, Democrat or Republican, whether we favor neighbors united, stop B town up zoning, or go farther together, that racism has been and still is a problem in our community. And more importantly, that we will make a commitment to challenge racism whenever and wherever it raises its ugly head. All that is a given. But here's the problem with this particular proposal. If you want to solve a problem, you look for a proven effective solution and you try to avoid things that will make the problem worse. Despite the word affordability being tossed around almost casually by the mayor and upzoning proponents, we've never heard exactly how building more plexes throughout the city will in any way address our current problems of affordability. In fact, the data says just the opposite. The most rigorous and well-respected study to date was done by Yona Freemark of MIT, looking at five years of data from upzoning in Chicago. He found that far from increasing affordability, upzoning causes land and housing prices to go up almost immediately. And Jody and Morse, in a study of upzoning in neighborhoods throughout New York City, concluded that, quote, zoning changes frequently increase the cost of land, which in turn increases the cost of housing. They concluded that new market rate housing created through upzoning, quote, has resulted in the loss of more affordable housing units than it has created. The claims that upzoning will in any way improve equity in housing is also not supported by the data, and again, contradicted by the evidence in places where upzoning has actually occurred. Studies of upzoning around the country have found that it leads to increases in racial and economic displacement. Put simply, as upzoning drives housing prices and rent up, it drives poor residents and residents of color out. A 2020 study done by New York University studying upzoning in that city found that there was a 7 to 9% increase in white residents in upzoned areas, even though white populations were going down elsewhere in the city. Another study in New York City found that over 10,000 Latino residents were displaced from their neighborhoods over a 10 year period due to upzoning. So far from meeting the goals of the comprehensive plan in terms of affordability and equity, it is likely that this proposal will decrease affordability and equity. Faced with this evidence, the proponents of upzoning typically retreat some and argue that yes, the process will take time, but new market rate housing will eventually free up less expensive housing, eventually making it available for less wealthy individuals. The technical term is filtering. It's a doozy of an argument, so bear with me while I try to explain it. One strong and nationally recognized advocate of upzoning from the conservative think tank, the Mercatus Center, defined it as wealthy folks moving out of their homes so that less wealthy people can move into their old homes. Now, I'd forgive those of you for raising your eyebrows about whether this would ever apply to Bloomington, since it will not likely be the wealthy who move into new duplexes, but students who are loved by the way. But there's an even more fundamental flaw in the theory of filtering. The Institute of Intergovernmental Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, closely analyzed the data on housing production and displacement and concluded that, quote, the filtering process can take generations, meaning that units may not filter at the rate that meets current needs. And they said, by the time filtering works, quote, the property may deteriorate too much to be habitable. The other argument we hear from upzoning proponents when they back down in the face of actual evidence is that allowing upzoning is only part of what we need to improve affordability in Bloomington. I have to heartily agree. And I need to point out that these measures are not going to increase affordability. They are not going to increase equity. These are serious problems in our community that need serious attention. We, sh we shouldn't be using uh, tactics that simply have shown that they will do just the opposite of what they claim, reducing affordability, time's up, and reducing equity in housing. Thank you. Ruth Kenny. Hi, um, I, my name's Ruth Kenny, and I moved here about six years ago. And I'll be honest, I, you know, I kind of got into this later and I, so I've taken the, the criticism of not being, you know, not paying close enough attention early enough. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll take that criticism. Um, but I did start listening to some of the, uh, some of the different meetings that we've had over the couple, past couple of months. And it does seem to me there must be something driving this besides what we're being told, because 
it, it just doesn't really make sense. I, I recently drove through the, the northern neighborhood and I don't understand why if what our objective is, is to find more moderate housing, that we wouldn't try to claw back some of those neighborhoods that have that students have infiltrated that are that are all rental. Why wouldn't we try to pull them back and have those homes, especially if we're building a student zone? And so these are existing homes. I think I just think it would make sense to try to revitalize those neighborhoods. I went to a planning meeting uh, when I uh, at the, about the Hillside Henderson uh, complex that was built uh, earlier on when I moved here, and there were, and I had to sit through a meeting about uh, beforehand about something one of the neighborhoods in the north. Uh, and there were people crying because their neighborhoods were being taken over. So I understand why these people who've lived here a long time are worried about that happening to their neighborhood. And some of the some of this feels very ageist to me um, that 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 the that the elderly people in our community are not being given um, much respect for the experience they have lived. So, I mean, I just would, I would just ask that people who are, you know, people who, who I mean, so we, we're riding sort of this experience versus change line, but these beautiful homes that already exist, I would just wonder why we aren't trying to get them back. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Steve Akers. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much planning commissioners and staff for, for your time uh, on this subject. It's very important. I've listened and, and I'm finally getting the comments. So I, uh, I do want to ask you to uh, vote no today or at least forward it to the city council and let them wrestle with this. Uh, I am I am Steve Akers of Park Ridge neighborhood, and uh, I have to say I respect the character of my neighborhood. Uh, I lived in the Bryan Park neighborhood for three years before moving to Park Ridge, and I've been uh, raised our kids in Park Ridge neighborhood to live close to university school for 30 years. Uh, just recently retired from housing on the IU campus. Uh, I do appreciate uh, Julian bringing up and Jackie supporting uh, the, I guess, an olive branch uh, uh, regarding the uh, monitoring the growth of duplexes. Uh, if we do get this passed, I, I would appreciate that if that information would go through hand uh, so that the neighborhoods are aware of uh, how many of these uh, duplexes or multiplexes do come online. Uh, I have to say I'm really disappointed that um, that at least some of the commissioners who have voted uh, to move on some of these things have have not given more thought or at least given uh, more respect. I, I don't want to be disrespectful to Charlotte Zitlow, Tommy Allison, Dave Rollo, Chris Sturbaum, Carrie Thompson, of, uh, uh, absolutely. Margaret Clemens with her data, amazing. And, and the thoughtfulness and academic folks with Richard Lewis, Peter Dorfman, and Russ Skiba. Uh, and finally, Barry Clapper of the zoning appeal process. You know, if we had kept it, if we had kept and voted in favor of at least reviewing the duplex proposals, and as Barry said, to have a conversation between the proposed the person proposing the duplex and the neighbors to work things out. Barry made a really good point, but it was, but you guys voted it down. So that's unfortunate. Um, I am part of the go farther together. And I, I was hoping that we could pause this. I know a lot of people feel like we've been talking about this for a long time, but this is really, really an important uh, element. And I, I'd really like to see it work. I'm really torn about duplexes. You know, I feel like, I was part of the missing middle uh, for a while, but worked very hard to uh, be able to live in the Park Ridge neighborhood and and uh, and have a single family home. Um, I feel like the duplexes are, and I've worked <laughs> fortunately against a lot of developers, but I've coordinated with developers as well. Uh, but I feel like the duplexes really are Trojan horses uh, that 
uh, as affordable housing or offering opportunity for the missing middle. I, I don't feel that's that's going to be an opportunity. I think I feel like developers, when they build and, and when they invest a lot of money into the duplexes, the rents will be way f- you know, out of reach of the missing middle. I wish they were there for the missing middle because those, fo- those, those young families need that opportunity. So I guess uh, finally, I would say, as Dave Rollo mentioned just now, there are places for plexus, but not in the core neighborhoods. If they're along the arteries where we've got good uh, transportation, where people don't have cars or choose not to have a car and use our amazing bus line and transportation, let's make that happen. Uh, Again, I'd ask you to um, vote no tonight, or at least if you do vote yes, uh, I think as we did in 2018, I don't think this, gonna, this is going to work. It's just the wrong, the wrong way to go. But I think there is a path somehow to do this. It's just such a difficult topic uh, in a college, a big college town like Bloomington. Uh, uh, I oversaw uh, many staff that chose not to live in the city of Bloomington due to taxes. It's just a, such a complex, complex uh Uh, predicament that we're in. And I applaud the planning department uh, to really look at this and find workable solutions. Um, And I hate that it's, you know, I really hate that this has become somewhat generational. I think my voice, I sound like an old guy. Uh, It's, it's really unfortunate that it's become that way, but just look at the experience and hold and give value to those experienced people like, you know, Rollo and Sturbaum and Zitlow and Allison, those people have been there. They've done it. Uh, and I applaud Susan Stanberg for, for uh, you know, holding up the, the pause button and, and giving us a voice. Thank you very much. Stephen Lehman. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Lehman. And uh, I'm going to ask you to please vote no tonight. And I object to the plexus and the possible loss of strict zoning for all the previously stated reasons. There's been a lot of great speakers on tonight. Um, Many people, including myself, believe that home ownership is the key to financial stability. I personally do not believe that renting in duplexes is gonna make that happen. I don't believe that renting in duplexes is gonna bring down the cost of home ownership. What we really need are additional uh, affordable home ownership programs. And I'm asking the planning commission and the city council and the rest of uh, the government here in Bloomington to please work on that, make that your priority, not priority to rentals for folks that are just passing through town like students and things like that. Uh, not for developers that are gonna come from other areas, but let's keep it local. Let's make it happen for Bloomington and for the res- residents. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments uh, on ZO 09-21 as amended? I don't see any more raised hands. I don't see any there, none on Facebook. Okay, last call for public comment on ZO 09-21 as amended. Going once, going twice. All right, that will conclude public comment. Um, We will come back now to the commission um, for additional uh, questions or final comments. Uh, I think it might be appropriate at this time uh, if someone would like to move for a very brief recess. Um, uh, I I think, um, you know, five to 10 minutes would be appropriate at this point, but uh, uh, Commissioner Kinsey, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I would like to make a motion for a, if we could do 10 minutes, I need some water and need to a bio break. Thank you. Second. Okay, uh, the motion is for a 10 minute break, uh, 10 minute recess. We have a second. Um, all those in favor of uh, recess, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are going to take a 10 minute break. That means we will reconvene at... 757, uh, uh, 758 on my clock here. Um, 
Thank you for your patience. We'll be right back. Looks like we're back. Looks like we have a quorum. So we'll go ahead and uh, continue. Uh, we are back to the commission now for final comments uh, on ZO 09-21 as amended. Um, we also will need a motion uh, for our final recommendation here. Uh, we can do that before we start comments or uh, we can make some comments first if you like. Um, but uh, if we get through the comments and no one's made a motion, we'll, we'll call for one again, but we'll need a motion um, uh, to, um, to forward this to the city council uh, with a recommendation uh, of some sort or to, uh, or to deny it. So um, I think Commissioner Kate, I saw your hand there. Do you wanna go first? Yes, I, no, I wasn't going to make a motion. I actually have a question for the city attorney coming off of one of the comments that we heard in, from the public. Sure, go ahead. So um, uh, uh, Mr. Rooker, could you comment on uh, Tommy Allison's uh, comment that uh, since we've heard so much about being able to pull back if this is moving too fast, I believe I heard her say that there would be a takings issue in terms of downzoning. Can you comment on whether that is something the city has studied? And if so, what have you found? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Kate. You know, it, it's very difficult to talk about a potential takings issue in a vacuum. Um, I, I really can't comment in generalities on whether or not um, a zoning change like this might result in a takings. It's going to depend on a lot of factors, including what sort of um, uh, expectations were uh, in place at the time a property was uh, invested in. So hey, it's really Yes. Sorry, can I interrupt you? Beth, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe what Ms. Allison said was that if we do uh, add the opportunity for duplexes in town, that then later, if we went to remove them, that she thinks that would be a taking. So I think that's what Beth yes. is asking you about, about that potential future right. removal. Yeah, and I think I think it's just impossible to talk about in a vacuum. It, we'd have to we'd have to look at a specific case in order to have any sense about whether or not it presents a takings issue. So I guess what I'm asking is because I, I understand and agree that a takings by definition is an area where you have to look at the particularities of each case. But have you looked at whether um, other places that have upzoned and then tried to you know, <clears throat> pulled back, if you will. Has, has this been something that you all have uh, taken a look at to see whether there have been comparable experiences and whether that has produced a range of those sorts of claims uh, against the city that they would then have to bear? I can make a quick comment on that, which is that we've heard stated numerous times at these meetings um, that the 1995 zoning code was in fact a down zone that quote unquote protected the historic neighborhoods uh, you know, and that that's what's kept them in place this time, since this time. Mike may be able to speak um, in more in a more detailed way about whether or not we were sued for a taking at that time. It's not my understanding that that is the case. Um, but uh, here, you know, that happened. What she's describing is what they have said. And when you read the minutes of the council minutes, what they say over and over in those meetings that they're doing in 1995, which is down zoning. Uh, these neighborhoods. So I would think, I don't know why the outcome would be different with what they they did uh, 25 years ago to what could, what what they're saying could happen uh, in the future. And just to, just to piggyback on what Jackie said, the, the answer to your question is broadly no, Commissioner Kate. You know, th this is not, down zoning down the road is not something that we anticipate would be uh, create a, a, an unusual risk of litigation. Um, although it might warrant additional research, it is an interesting point. Uh, that's not something that I've come across or that I'm familiar with, being a, a potential risk that we need to be worried about. Thank you both. Uh, Commissioner Burrell. Um, so we're... Can we add recommendations to our 
our proposal? Well, can we add conditions to our proposed recommendation to the council at this point or not? At this point, uh, you, it would any changes would have to be done through the amendment process, which would be proposing an amendment, getting a second, going through public comment, and voting. Uh, okay. That's the only way to change it at this point. Obviously, of course, if you make a public statement here and or go to council or write to your council person as a member of the plan commission, uh, you know those are uh, also options for making um, uh, opinions known about things that uh, you may have they think still need. Um, uh, that you may uh, think still need attention. Okay. Well, in particularly, what, what I, I guess a question to you, um, uh, Jackie, or, or anybody that can expand on this. So the, the historic neighborhoods have extra protection than any other neighborhood, correct? The many, yes, many of the historic neighborhoods also have historic preservation protection, correct? Correct. So even if we have uh, passed, even if this, this amendment that we vote for today is passed, um, the Historic Preservation Commission can protect this district against upzoning, correct? I'm sorry, please say that again. So even if it's, this is passed today in historic preservation uh, districts, mm -hmm. uh, anything will have to be approved by the historic preservation, any changes will have to be approved by the historic preservation commission. Correct, any physical changes to buildings in historic districts are subject to the historic district guidelines. That will not change depending on, uh, that does not change whether or not the use allowances uh, for those structures changes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Additional uh, comments or questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Herrera. Yeah, I believe this question, um, it goes for Jackie or, or whoever in the, in the city could um, answer. So if the council rejects the two amendments, amendment uh, number two and number three, uh, my understanding it will come back to uh, plan commission for, uh, for discussion again. Correct. So the uh, whatever happens tonight, um, if the, if it were to be approved tonight, it would go as amended to council. And if they make any changes to it um, related to an, any of the text, then plan commission will see that um, again. Correct. So any kind of amendment or change to amendment two or three uh, will be uh, as the council, if that happens, if there is an amendment to our two amendments, it will come back to plan commission for- For, for, some, for a certification, yes, that's correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Commissioner Henry Randolph. I just wanna make a quick comment. Can I be heard okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Just making sure. Um, I just want, uh, since I've sat here with everyone for numerous hours listening, and um, I know the severity uh, uh, of these decisions are pretty uh, hard on everybody. Um, but my point was to say that I'm a representative of, from the Monroe County uh, Plan Commission, and I'm a non-voting member. So I, I wanted to make that clear to the public since they've uh, seen my face uh, for numerous hours now. Um, and then I, I wanted to make one other comment. I, w I work in an area of uncertainty and I, uh, have to make decisions based off of that uncertainty. I think that's kind of what we have going on here. Sometimes the way I, uh, will determine those decisions is by disruption and how that disruption is contained. Um, Right now, 
I don't know if we have the best mechanisms to contain the disruption. Um, I know this is not an easy question. And also, I probably won't be looked at too kindly by either the county or the city, but we still are looking at annexation. And what kind of disruption will that do? Um, because if we do annex, they will be governed over the city ordinance over time. So I just want, I don't want that to, you know, go into long discussions. I just wanted to point that out. I think it's something that needs to be said. And I just wanted everyone to understand my role here on the plan commission. Thank you. Any other final comments? Uh, Commissioner Kinsey. Well, this, this might take a couple rounds to kind of get all the comments that I've um, accumulated here um, to get through. So I hope that the public and my fellow commissioners will indulge me as much as we've been listening to what other people have to say. Um, you know, I, I want to begin with a couple of clarifying, clarifying comments. Um, one, I, I really appreciate Steve Akers' comment that this is a bit of a predicament. Um, you know, this is not an easy um, topic. It is not easy to sit here and listen to uh, people I consider friends and neighbors um, tell me that I'm not listening and tell me that I'm being disrespectful when I don't feel that's the case at all. Um, I'm trying to be as respectful as I can given the role that I play on this plan commission to advise and to listen. So I'm, I'm, I, I, it's hard to sit and listen to that um, as somebody who considers themselves an active listener. Um, and consider it. So, but to get to a couple of clarifying points, I think is really important. One is I, I hear a lot of slippage in our language and what we've been talking about tonight. And I don't mean this as a fault um, against anyone who spoke tonight at all, but I do want to point out again that we're talking about um, duplexes in the two amendments that were approved as part of this um, ordinance. So I, I, I wanna just remind us that that's, it's not about try and quad in the amendment portion of it. So that's very important, I think. I also wanna clarify Jeff Richardson's comments about Ann Arbor. And just to say that, you know, that story is pretty complex too. In fact, a lot of what I read when I went and did some homework on what was happening in Arbor is that yes, they're doing a number of things with their municipal code right now, including relaxing standards on ADUs. They're wrestling with ending single family uh, zoning. They have two, what they call two family zoning, uh, which what we're describing as duplexes in their code. They do have that allowance in their code. And in the past two years have had mixed down zoning and up zoning. Um, so even in response to that conversation we were just having about takings, um, that seems to be going on in Ann Arbor where they recently, as recent as February, had a discussion about down zoning in certain districts um, in their, in their um, part of their UDO. So I, I, I don't mean to present that as a, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I realized my reference to what was happening in Ann Arbor and Chapel Hill were quick high gloss in the last comment that we had. Um, and it is a complex story. And I guess what I, I bring the attention, those two examples to the attention of council, because I think they're doing a lot of the same things that we're wrestling with. So I guess the, the one thing I can say with confidence is that we're not alone in this situation in, I think, another college town. So the, the um, examples of Minneapolis and Portland, I find farther afield as well, which is why I went to look to see what was happening in some other college towns. Um, and it is complex. It's not an easy summarizing kind of thing to say. The other thing that I think I want to continue to clarify is um, that 
we can't just look at the permitted duplexes as a single act and as the only thing that's part of this. Part of what has really convinced me to do this is that I've spent a lot of time now getting acquainted from now two years ago when we first started discussing after the comprehensive plan, the UDO, um, that the whole point of it, the UDO was to set some more reliable, clear, transparent standards, very specific residential district standards and use specific standards that would dictate size and height and roof pitch and entrances um, that would make things more clear and also in some ways regulated. Um, so I think that whole notion of um, feeling like this is somehow a, a completely um, dangerous, or I think the word that was used was reckless proposal, to me doesn't sit with the very specific use specific standards and the residential district standards that are already outlined in the UDO. Um, you know, if we could put up all of that at the same time, people were talking about, you know, I keep wanting to point, it's right here in the allowable table, what's allowed and what isn't. Um, I think it would help people feel a little um, more secure in how we were moving. I do feel like we're moving slowly to examine this because of all the safeguards that are in other places um, in our UDO. And, you know, I, I think we're not ignoring, or at least I'm not, I'll speak for myself, I'm not ignoring what people are saying. It's just that I feel like there are other places in the UDO that afford those safeguards. Um, so I don't think I'm being cavalier or reckless or ignorant of the history. But I think is that this is a very different discussion today than it was 25 years ago um, in a very different um, code. So I feel better about the whole, the totality of our UDO, not just the fact that we are permitting duplexes um, in R1, R2, and R3. So I, I think that's another thing I wanna, I just keep wanting to go back to is that, um, and, and it's hard to talk about this because, you know, without getting into the weeds pretty quickly, so for me, there are those safeguards um, that I want to assure the public are part of this whole consideration. The other thing that is um, interesting to me is, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that I really would like to see some reporting mechanism and some um, uh, inclusion of in the whereas clauses, some reporting expectations. And I, I think that is where perhaps we could do some of what the public is asking in terms of um, getting input about what you need to see in order to determine if this is working in the way we hoped and, uh, and if it isn't. Um, maybe that's where we really spend some time developing, um, uh, as I think Jan Sorby said, what is it that we want to see as success for this? Um, that seems like a good place as we start to identify how are we gonna measure and monitor that we would have a vision for what success looks like. And that to me would be a good place to involve the public um, as we proceed. The other thing is um, I think the, the um, shift to making duplexes permitted is also important to acknowledge the fact that there are still safeguards in place and that actually um, from what I understand from what city planning has shared is um, that when, when a building permit is issued, it actually requires even more detail than it would have required um, the review in a conditional use proposal. So we're not really doing a, by permitting use, we're not completely wiping away all review. Um, a building permit actually requires a higher level of review, information and commitment from a property owner. Um, yes, the trade-off is it's not a public um, process in that way, but the standards for approval don't change. So, you know, I, I think that's an important thing and perhaps that's another mechanism we can put in place to 
process a review and let's see what's happening in those uh, permitting processes. So I also felt more assured uh, after hearing that. Uh, so, okay, that's, that's a lot for me. Perhaps that's the most I've ever spoken all at once. <laughs> um, and I appreciate the time, but I think there's a lot of clarifying that we can do through this process. Um, and I, I don't want to ignore um, what anyone has to, had to say tonight or in the three meetings prior um, but about this particular issue. But I really, I don't wanna hinder modernizing our zoning um, on this one aspect. I really think we've packaged together a, a really well-developed UDO um, that will allow us to safeguard and move um, both with some in, um, intensity, but with some safeguards in place. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Um, are there additional final comments from commissioners? Can, Go ahead, Commissioner Kate. Yeah, I just wanted to get a clarification on one thing that you just said, uh, Jillian and Jackie, this may go back to what we were talking about the other day. Uh, my understanding is that the, the permitting documentation versus conditional use documentation and the level of submission that was required came in the context of our discussing whether someone could game the system and do very little and kind of put place a hold effectively on building in the neighborhood. And my understanding was that the response, Jackie, was, well, it's actually harder to do that under a uh, permitted uh, system because it's, it would be easier to start and then stop the conditional use process. But it was not that uh, there is no difference in the factors involved in evaluating a build project, whether it is permitted by right or whether it is uh, conditional use, because there are a, additional criteria, right? When you're looking at something that, okay, all right. Yes, so, okay, so for the public, uh, the discussion was uh, if it, uh, how in the context of someone pulling a permit uh, for a duplex to uh, potentially stop their neighbors from being able to do it, um, how does changing from conditional to by right affect that? So in a conditional use um, situation, uh, it's my opinion that uh, we use uh, the documents that are required for that as far as professionally designed documents, documents you have to pay someone to do like an architect um, or an engineer uh, are minimal. Um, you know, if you're, for example, doing an interior remodel um, to do the duplex uh, and you don't have those architectural plans yet, but you can uh, show that you can meet all the use specific standard requirements, then the um, drawings and things you're bringing to uh, plan to Board of Zoning Appeals are going to be pretty minimal. But if you're applying for a building permit, you have to have all of those things in hand, um, the architectural and engineering and engineered plans and that that costs more money. So yeah, it was in the, it was in the context of um, if your first step allows you to freeze out your neighbors, uh, which one is probably uh, more often cheaper. And of course, obviously there are, um, exceptions to both of those situations, but that more often than not, I think that uh, if someone was trying to um, hold the conditional use permit for their area or, or, or duplex permit, excuse me, for their area in the conditional use context, it would be easier. It would be easier to do that in a cheaper way than it would be in a buy right situation. Right. And that was also part of the discussion when there was the buffer, right? That right. was where this, yeah. this arose is because right. of the buffer. So, okay. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Herrera. Yeah, so Jackie also along the same line, uh, I believe one of the, the, the differences with the condi conditional and permitted would be the participation of the neighbors, participation of the community, where they can provide feedback about what is what is happening, what is going on. That's what we will be looking with. The 100%, yes. That in the conditional use context, part of the reason why we proposed it in that manner was that, uh, then you would have the public hearing where your neighbors within 300 feet or two properties deep would be notified. You would have to go to your neighborhood association that uh, those things would be required. Uh, one thing that came up 
I, I will mention, I don't think at the last hearing, but the hearing before was that um, if you really are neighborly with your neighbors, maybe your local zoning code doesn't have to mandate that you discuss uh, your plans um, with those people. And I think that that was a notion that those who voted to make it permitted kind of raised that uh, um, just because it's not mandated by the code, it could, it could and should of course still happen. But yes, we uh, definitely propose it to be conditional to um, encourage that line of communication and that opportunity for neighbors to be able to speak about the issue. Thank you, Jackie. Additional comments or a motion? Oh, sorry. Yeah, continue, Commissioner Herrera. Yeah, no, I, I would like just to, to make my, my, my comment about this because I, I oppose Amendment 2 and Amendment 3. Uh, I, I, I favor or uh, welcome the, the proposal from uh, the staff and, and, and and how it was originally presented, and and and, and the reason why, and, and and also with some comments from our citizens, our our uh, uh, audience, is is the importance of uh, if we are doing this. Uh, uh, my personal opinion would be doing with caution. I mentioned this the last the last time, uh, because uh, I believe uh, our uh, citizen Richard. Richard Lewis mentioned about the importance of monitoring, having follow-ups in, in any first instance, in any first stage. So uh, my, my, my opinion, my personal position would be uh, to have this kind of uh, a, a way of, uh, of, uh, of knowing what's, what's happening in, in, a, in a first stage if we are going to open the possibility for Building uh, a plexus in 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 the in the core neighborhoods. I am against. I am not in favor of uh, giving everything at the same time. Give, giving everything at all at the same time, because we don't know the 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 the, the huge consequences that this might or might not uh, bring. So, just a, a personal comment about. I just stick to the original the original uh, proposal from the staff. I oppose Amendment 2 and Amendment 3, and that's something that I, is going to be aligned with my vote. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sandberg. Thank you. Needless to say, I am dismayed and disappointed with the direction that this is taking, because I too uh, was thinking that what the staff had recommended as a, as a vastly pared down arrangement was what we were going to be discussing. And even that, based on my strong communications with members of this community, both for and against, I'm listening to everyone, I'm weighing and measuring the consequences, both intended and otherwise, that our actions here could possibly present to the city of Bloomington. And so even with the conditional uses and even with the paring down of R4, there are still questions that remain. And you heard very good questions from some very talented, very devoted, very concerned citizens tonight, who I also represent as an at-large city council member. And so uh, again, I'm dismayed. I will not be voting yes on this. Uh, I will be um, grateful, absolutely grateful for the opportunity to once again involve the community, perhaps in a little bit more of a, of a uh, you know, uh, citizen to elected official position to hear them out. And I think there have been many missteps made along the way. I think we heard about some of that tonight and some of the anger and the frustration that we heard from the public that this whole process has appeared to them to be very top down and not bottom up. And I think a lot of the tension a lot of the division could have been prevented had we taken the step. And that's why I very strongly advocated for the take the pause position, hit the pause button. This is not ready for prime time. And I am hopeful that by continuing the conversation before the elected officials in the city council, we will have an opportunity to adjust this, 
to get it right. Because as I agree with many people who said tonight, we agree on probably about 90% of the goals here, affordability, inclusivity, diversity of housing stock, the need for the missing middle. We're just in disagreement about the aggressive nature that we have just taken this from more of a compromised position to even worse. And so I think we've gone backwards and not forwards. So again, um, my respect to everyone who I serve with on, on this, uh, this commission. I know you all have thought long and hard as have I, um, but I will be voting no tonight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner King. Sorry to be coming in and out so piecemeal, but you know, I'll just get my final comments before I vote. So I'm going to be voting no on this amendment. I felt that the staff uh, hit the right note in the original amendment, which provided for conditional use. Uh, that's why I voted originally no on amendment two to make this by right. Um, I will say I, I generally, I said this earlier, uh, um, I generally like by right uh, building and less subjectivity and opportunities for uh, individualized analysis. But in this particular instance, I, I think that proceeding with some more caution for reasons that some of the fellow commissioners have said, but uh, particularly a number of the members of the community have noted. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the need for Kind of taking this a little bit slower, knowing that we can always speed up, but it may be harder to slow down. It may not be impossible. It may not even generate takings if we slow down. But uh, given that it hasn't been all that long since the UBO has been in effect uh, in its current form, and um, you know we're already back and making uh, what appear to be uh, extraordinarily large changes. I think that um, going a little bit more cautiously uh, to me felt like the right note at this time. Uh, I voted for getting rid of the buffer because honestly, I thought uh, a cap would make more sense and, and be a more straightforward way to try to achieve the same impact and get the value of by right design, but only up to a point or by right uh, approval. But, uh, but I couldn't uh, come up with a measure that, uh, in honesty, uh, made sense. Uh, and part of that was because every time I sat down with different measures, uh, it, it seemed to be so idiosyncratic uh, in order to apply that in some fair and equivalent way across uh, neighborhoods, um, which are very different. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons also why uh, I felt like going back to the original proposal from staff, which uh, involves conditional approval, uh, felt like the right way to go. Again, understanding that, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, closely monitoring this. I think that was always uh, staff's intent. I think that Commissioner Kinsey's, what she spoke about earlier with uh, gathering in some more data and getting regular reports uh, just reinforces the desire uh, there to keep a close eye on this uh, and that uh, makes sense, but I think I'd probably feel better uh, keeping that eye on from uh, a conditional use approval beginning and then speeding up rather than throwing it open uh, and then trying to claw it back. Um, the last thing I'll say in terms of clawing it back, I think we heard that from Ruth Kenny about why aren't we clawing back some of the uh, housing that has turned into student rental housing, uh, these small uh, affordable homes uh, that kind of ring uh, parts of campus. Um, I've often wondered that myself uh, and someday hope to find an answer to that. So anyway, uh, with all that said, um, I will, with the greatest respect to everyone, I, I really think, you know, there are people feel very strongly about this on all sides. And frankly, there are good arguments on all sides as well. Um, so, you know, let's, let's really acknowledge it. This is an incredibly tough set of issues. And uh, I think everyone's trying their hardest to find a way to move forward to meet a lot of, um, of, uh, of desires and goals that are sometimes in tension with one another. But um, having said all that, I think for now, my best judgment for my vote is to vote no on this. All right, thank you. I will remind colleagues that um, we don't have a motion on the table yet. So uh, a yes or no vote doesn't mean anything really until we know what we're voting on. 
Um, so it probably would be good um, if someone would make a, a motion. Um, we can continue with comments if, if you like, but at some point we do need to get a motion on the table. So um, uh, Commissioner Cochran. I, I would be happy to make a motion, but, but Jackie helped me out a little bit. Um, so, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd like to make a motion that ZO9021 duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes text amendment is forwarded to the city council with a positive recommendation. As amended. As amended. Yep, that's great. Okay, is there a second for that motion? Commissioner Kinsey. I will second. Oh. Okay, we do have a motion and a second. The motion is to forward ZO09-21 as amended to the city council with a positive recommendation. Uh, is there any additional uh, comment? I guess, Commissioner Cochran, go ahead. Okay, so just a few comments. Uh, hang on, okay, okay, yeah, there we go. Uh, so just a few comments. First off, again, I would like to thank the public for their comments. And, um, and I know it was mentioned the disrespect, but I do truly respect everybody in attendance and their comments. And just because the decision goes one way or the other should never be perceived as disrespectful. I work with many of these individuals on the call and I consider them personal friends and I do value their expertise and opinions. So I do thank everyone for being here and being a part of the conversation. Um, by no means opportunities for plexes is a solution. It's just one step uh, forward to helping create more inventory, which in turn creates affordable housing. Do I agree that uh, plexes will only attract students? Um, no, I believe that it could attract young families, young professionals, and give opportunities for potential homeowners looking to offset a mortgage payment. And to echo Mrs. Bernstein, retirees want to retire to Bloomington which I think is a great compliment to our community. However, many of these retirees may have to rent and locating in a core neighborhood with all the benefits could be a great option for them. Uh, will all duplexes be market rate? Maybe, maybe not. Will it add additional housing options for our community, which would help affordable housing? Absolutely. So I will support as I um, uh, not, uh, recommended this, uh, uh, these amendments. Sorry, uh, Commissioner St. John, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I've stated my comments before. I'll be voting in favor of this. Um, it is a tough decision. It impacts everyone. Um, there will be consequences. Some will be good and some will be bad. They will not be bad for all. They also will not be good for all. It's a very tough uh, decision, but we do need more housing. Um, and we have studies that show that uh, supply and demand does work. Um, I respect comments from the public that disagree with that. Um, I, I've stated before, I do not think that this will cause neighborhoods to be overrun by students. Um, IU Institutional Research and Reporting shows very flat student enrollment over the last 10 years, plus if you take into account uh, demographics of high school, um, students, there will be a cliff and it's coming. And so we will see a decrease in students. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to cause students to overrun neighborhoods. Um, comments have been made by commissioners about the lack of, um, uh, about the fact that it's, it's not a big development opportunity for people in the long run. Maybe initially there will probably be some speculating um, and I'm not going to dispute that, but in, uh, it's just the numbers don't necessarily work for some of the more expensive houses in some of these neighborhoods we're talking about. Um, planning and Transportation Director uh, Robinson addressed infrastructure comments in our last meeting. Um, equity and affordability is important. It needs to be addressed. And this is a small part of addressing that, just a small part. Um, it's incremental. Um, uh, I support the city monitoring plexes. Um, they're not going to solve the problem. They're not gonna solve the housing affordability problem or the inequality and equity problem, but they can address it. Um, and something does need to be done uh, to address it. And so status quo is not gonna help us get there. We need to take a step. And this is a step forward to do that, a small incremental step. And in terms of the comments um, from the public that we have not been respectful, 
I've observed all the commissioners on both sides of the issue display hours of respectful listening and reading of public comment. We've um, all gone through a respectful analysis and weighing of the pros and cons and respectful thought process. Um, certainly, I respect my fellow commissioners who vote differently from my vote as they do, I know me. And simply, um, when we don't agree with members of the public who have spoken here, it isn't a lack of respect or that we haven't listened to you. We just simply disagree based on what we've seen and what we've heard and what we've read. So I do thank everyone for coming out. That's part of it. Um, I have stated my mind has been changed during this entire process over the last four or five meetings. Um, and so this process works, but it is long. And um, at the end of the day, we just have to make our decision of how we'll vote and I will vote in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sandberg. Thank you. Once again, now that the motion's on the table, I will reiterate that my vote will be no. Um, had there been another motion to forward this to the city council with no recommendation, I think it is at that phase of our discussion that we may have an opportunity to get things nailed down where it will have more consensus from the, the divided parties that have been here. Uh, with, with the uh, issue of respect on the table, maybe my skin's a little thicker uh, from having been a member of the city council. Uh, with every vote you take, you're going to please some constituents and you're gonna displease others. That's just the nature of the beast. Democracy is messy, people are passionate, and we as professionals up here, we sit here and we listen and we listen carefully and attentively. We're going to agree with some of you. We're gonna disagree with, with others. And that's how we make our decisions up here. But again, I am hopeful that once this gets brought to the city council, we will have another opportunity to fully vet this, iron out some of the issues that still perplex me to this day and is why I cannot vote for this. Thank you. It is deregulating and it is removing the guardrails. That to me is not responsible to the constituents that I serve. Thank you. Additional comments, uh, Commissioner Seabor, go ahead. Uh, I think you may still be muted, I can't. Um, we can't hear you, Andrew. Still can't hear you. May need to check your uh, your settings there. Anyone else, any other comments while we uh, wait for Andrew to get his audio um, uh, yes, set up? Go ahead. Yeah, yes, go ahead, I'm Commissioner Herrera. The, the, the motion right now is um, uh, with the two amend amendments that we, amendment two and amendment three, right? Correct. Yeah, the motion, the motion on the, on the table now is to forward uh, Z00921 as amended, so with Amendment 2 and Amendment 3, uh, to the City Council with a positive recommendation. Any other final comments? It looks like waiting. Andrew might have, yeah, left and going to try again here. Yeah, we'll give him a chance to get back in here and try again. There's Andrew, let's ask him to unmute. Let's see, is he back there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> Restart, that's always the best solution. Um, no doubt, restart. I, I guess just, uh, I'm gonna be really brief. Um, this is a really tough issue and I appreciate all the dialogue that the commission's had. I appreciate all the comments and time that the public has invested in sharing feedback, um, invested even outside of these meetings, thinking through things, researching them and sharing the information with us. I appreciate all the effort staff has put into putting together the original proposal and all the number of meetings, everything that's led up to this. 
And I guess just also want to highlight that I recognize this is just one step in the process. Ultimately, what we're doing is sending something on to city council. And I very much trust that they're going to deliberate this, deliber deliberate this uh, very carefully. And I trust that the public is going to continue to share your comments and that all of that what we're discussing now is going to be um, certainly shared at council. Um, you know, when we started these conversations a couple meetings ago uh, regarding the duplexes, um, I made some comments that I um, was certainly for keeping them in there as conditional use. Um, very much supportive of what the original uh, staff proposal was. I think it was a, a good balance of um, trying to take a measured approach, being incremental in the process, um, being mindful of everything that the city is trying to accomplish in the, the, the comprehensive plan and being uh, incorporating all the feedback the public has shared. Um, but with all this being said, I um, and I voted against the amendments. Um, so where we're at isn't necessarily where I um, was hoping, but at the same time, I, I do trust that city council is gonna look at this really carefully. And so I'm actually gonna be voting in favor, um, but recognizing um, that we're just forwarding it on to them and that there's gonna still be a lot more uh, discussion and dialogue. So um, that's uh, just what I wanted to add. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burrell. Um, I just want to thank everybody for the dialogue. I, I really am encouraged about such intelligent um, and thoughtful uh, comments from the public. I, and I think it's very, very important uh, for, for us to hear. What I love about this, uh, I love about this process is, is that this group, the Plan Commission, we are not elected officials. We are citizens. And we might have expertise in some area or another. Why? That's why we were chosen to participate, uh, uh, and we were selected to be in this in this group. But we are all citizens as well. But then, once whatever we decide here goes to the city council, and the city council are the elected officials. So it's it's a beautiful balance because we are voting based on what we're seeing uh, through research and what the, uh, the city presents to us, plus our own personal research, plus what uh, our own experience in our areas that where we serve. So it creates a very interesting process because even though we hear, we listen to the public, there, there's a, a, a bunch of things that we have to take in consideration. When it goes to the council, they are elected officials. They are they have to think for all the citizens as a whole. So this is a beautiful process. So don't feel discouraged with the vote tonight. It will go to the city council. I am I have full respect for them, and I know that they will they will vet this thoroughly, and they will look at it, everything again. And again, you have another another opportunity to participate. So. Keep the discussion, keep it going. I am voting yes, uh, so we can move forward and, with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other final comments? Uh, Commissioner Kinsey, I think I see your pen. I, I can't quite tell if you're- Sorry, sometimes my blurred background that. blurs yeah. more than what I want. I'm sorry about that. Um, Go ahead. So I, Again, uh, just a quick comment here. I've already said my long piece, uh, more than a piece. It was a, quite a whole, I think. Um, so just one more thing. I really appreciate Commissioner Burrell's um, summary of what our role is in this. And I, I've been thinking long and hard about our role in this process. It is, we, you know, we as members of the Plan Commission have been a part of not only many of us, not everybody was a part of the um, original comprehensive plan development, um, part of the UDO development. And of course, a lot of our perspective is informed by the regular work we do in every meeting of the plan commission and including our preparatory meetings when we meet with staff to try and better understand what our policies and guidelines are. So, you know, our perspective is, um, 
I don't want to say it's more than what anybody from the public has contributed tonight. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is our role has been constant in this very particular form. Um, so we're because we're on the commission, we're not bouncing in and out based on whatever issue captures our attention. We're here as a steady presence, um, considering what's happening in our community. So I do think I'm trying to bring all of that to bear on this decision tonight is what I've been hearing in the almost, well, it's about four years now that I've been serving on the plan commission. So I'm bringing all of that to bear um, on this discussion. And I was originally not, um, or I was originally had a different perspective on um, duplexes and multiplexes in the original UDO. And through that process, I was persuaded um, to welcome them. So I think I demonstrate some capacity to be persuaded. I, I didn't start out that way and was persuaded um, by public comment and people's interest in this. Um, and I think what has happened is I've, as I've learned more, I've become even more persuaded of their value um, in terms of equity and housing and this whole idea of modernizing our um, our beauty, our code, and uh, assuring that we're doing what's um, in the best interest of our community. Ultimately, I'm, I know that people will differ with me on that one. Um, so I um, am happy to to be able to have listened to everyone, and I just want to thank everybody for um, their attention and and heartfelt in many cases and well-informed comments. It really does help us have a better, more informed dialogue in this process. Um, I will be voting yes on this tonight because I do think it is the next step we need to take. It is one step. It is not the only step. It is not the ultimate solution, really. It is one small step um, towards intensity, to intensify and densify and increase our diversity of housing types. And I think that's an important step. I also, again, want to reiterate that I do think um, part of my view is that I believe in the rest of the planning um, documents between the comprehensive plan and our UDO safeguards. I really do believe that those have set us up well to proceed um, through this process. Um, so with that, uh, thanks everybody. And again, I look forward to city council weighing in on this as well. Thanks. All right, thank you. Any final, 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 final comments? Um, all right, I, I have a, a few things I'd like like to say, a number of things I'd, I'd like to say, not, not because I wanna belabor the point, but I do wanna just make sure that, um, just that we clearly communicate that, uh, you know, what, what we're thinking and what and what the what the plan here is. I know that there's been a lot of uh, perception that this has been a, a rushed or a careless process. Uh, some people have called it an experiment, um, and it's uh, it's perceived that in some ways this is targeted at, at the core neighborhoods and um, uh, and, and just re really none of those things are true. And so I just want to kind of take some time to 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 really kind of. Uh, Kind of present the bigger picture. Um, you know, the changes that we're talking about here uh, are really are part of a, a much bigger plan. Um, the entire UDO uh, that's been researched and debated, uh, it's been discussed publicly, uh, reviewed, and, and revised for years. Um, you know, we several years ago this process began. Uh, there have been public meetings, neighborhood meetings, weeks and weeks of debate at both here at the Planning Commission um, and at the City Council. Uh, and, and the result is a is a multifaceted plan, an entire new uh, UDO that we are now updating. Uh, again, based on even more research and, and more experience and, and more input. Uh, this, is, this is a years long process. Um, and 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 there really is nothing in this uh, proposal that is targeted at, at the core neighborhoods. This petition uh, simply would allow the same types of housing in all neighborhoods uh, throughout the entire city. 
Um, I think the reason that it's perceived to be targeted at the core neighborhoods is that those are those are the only neighborhoods who are o- organized against it. Um, but this would apply equally to to all neighborhoods throughout the, throughout the city. I think that's important to understand. Um, and these are changes that are, like I said, part of a, a much broader citywide plan. And I, I certainly, uh, you know, can't in this format do justice to the entirety of the plan. But I think it's important to to point out, um, you know, some examples of that of that context. Uh, I think most importantly, you can't really look here at these changes in 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 this petition without also looking at the changes uh, in the multifamily zones. So this UDO isn't you know, simply saying we're going to allow uh, more density in neighborhoods, plexes in neighborhoods, um, and that's the the answer to our problem. Uh, The UDO has other changes that allows, in fact, encourages far more dense housing in much larger developments uh, closer to campus. Um, We've, in fact, we've created an entire new zone uh, to steer the most dense development away from the core neighborhoods, specifically so that the demand for short-term, high-occupancy, undergraduate housing uh, is in the neighborhoods is reduced. We're, we're creating a whole new zone uh, that encourages that type of development to, to occur in, in, in that zone, in the uh, student-oriented zone. Um, and, I, and I totally understand how it, easy it is to kind of look at um, anecdotes or look at uh, this in a vacuum and 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 get the impression um, that the supply and demand just doesn't work here. It's it's pretty easy to look around and say, well, you know, the supply the supply of uh, rental housing has increased. We see new apartments going up, and yet prices are still going up. So how is that possible? That must mean that supply and demand don't work. But the simple reality is that even though we've increased our supply the demand has increased far faster than the supply. Um, that's why we see prices going up. The demand is increasing way faster than our supply is. And I know that can be hard to believe because you look around and it looks like there's new apartments going up everywhere. Um, but we are still playing catch up uh, in the supply and demand equation. Um, why, why, we've heard so much about why, about Bloomington being so attractive to out of town developers. Why is that? Well, it's not because our zoning code is so friendly that developers just can't wait to come build here. Uh, it's because we have so much unmet demand. The demand is sky high. That is why uh, there's. That's why it's attractive to out-of-town developers. That's why housing prices are high. Um, it's because we are not meeting the demand, and so. Um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of arguments um, against this. Uh, almost all of them are really uh, focused on that rental housing. Um, and we do need more rental housing. I know some people don't believe that, but we need more rental housing. But I also want to point out that this is not, that's not what this is about. This is not just about rental housing. There's nothing in this that says, uh, you know, that these have to be rental units. In fact, you know, my hope uh, is that most of these will not be rental units. You know, each unit in a duplex can be separately owned. Uh, will some be rentals? Of course they will. Um, but many of them will be owner occupied, um, giving, you know, giving new homeowners a chance to, to live in, in our neighborhoods. Um, there's been a lot of talk about naturally occurring uh, affordable housing. Um, and I, I, I think that's a little bit of a, uh, a misnomer, maybe uh, wishful thinking. There's, there's really, no such thing as naturally occurring housing. Houses, houses are built. Uh, every one of us lives uh, in a building that at one time was new construction. And every one of us lives in a building that when it was built, changed the landscape of Bloomington. Um, every new building that gets built changes the landscape of Bloomington. Um, each one of us changed the character of, of our neighborhood and of, of our city when, when our homes were built. Uh, whether that's a single family home or a duplex or an apartment complex uh, or whatever it may be. Um, and this is this has been the case since the beginning of time. The, the idea that some of us live in natural housing that needs to be protected and the next thing that gets built is just a threat to that natural housing is just uh, a perception uh, based on whether your home has been built yet or not. If you're looking at uh, trying to move here, wanting to live in a home or trying to move from rental into an owner, uh, occupied home, 
your perception is very, very different. Um, you know, I, I've been here for, for 28 years now, uh, I, and I don't say that to imply that it gives me more weight or makes my, more, my opinion more important, but I know there's plenty of people who have been here much longer than that. Uh, but the point is, you know, I fell in love with Bloomington the day I got here. And, and I've seen the same phenomenon for, for 28 years now. People move to Bloomington and they fall in love with it and they love it just the way it is. And as soon as as soon as they get settled, we start thinking about how can we keep it just the way it is. Um, and that's an easy temptation. I've, you know, I'm tempted by that constantly as well. Um, but for every single one of us, if if the people here before us had won the battle to lock things in and keep it the status quo, keep it the way it was, um, then we wouldn't have the places that we live. Um, and, and so we have to really just be conscious of the fact that um, we're all the beneficiary of progress and change and, and change in the character of the city and the change in the character of our neighborhoods. Um, I think we all have a consensus that we need more affordable housing. There, there, there seems to be um, a great consensus on that. And so I think the real debate here has just simply been you know, where should that affordable housing go? Um, and, and, you know, we, we talked about this before. I think there's really, there's, there's two options, you know, either it can be uh, really segregated and really isolated in, in you know, something to a lot of people have suggested, well, the hospital site is the perfect uh, place for this. Um, and, you know, I, and I just, I just don't accept that. I don't think that, uh, you know, isolating the housing into one location and trying to jam all of it into one location um, is the way to go. Um, putting it on the outskirts is something that other people have, have suggested. Um, and that, that really is not a great solution either because then you have increased costs of transportation um, and you have increased uh, demand on, uh, on infrastructure and, and increased congestion, more car trips. Um, you know, uh, a, a lot of people have asserted too that we need more single family homes, that we don't need more rentals. Um, well, where would we build more single family homes? We don't have undeveloped cornfields uh, in the city just waiting to be built out with more single family homes. The, 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 the simple fact is that home prices will not drop until the supply exceeds the demand. That means the supply has to start growing faster than the demand. The only responsible way for us to do that is to have that supply be built throughout the community in a in an integrated way and that means increasing the number of homes we have on the lots that we already have um, the only alternative is to have segregated isolated housing um, but that might create more affordable units um, but does not create an affordable life um, it, it increases transportation costs it decreases quality of life um, so um, I just I want to just wrap up by just uh, driving home the point again that um, property values and housing costs are just are not the same thing. Um, and I know it's easily confused, um, but you can simultaneously increase property value and decrease housing costs. Uh, I know that that sounds like a paradox, but it but it's not. So just imagine if you want to buy a single family house. And that house has a $1,000 a month payment. You, you can't afford $1,000 a month. Um, if someone else wanted to buy that house and turn it into a rental, um, they'd have to charge maybe $1,500 a month in rent to make it worth uh, paying $1,000 a month in, in mortgage. Now, imagine if you took that same house and now you're allowed to put a two-bedroom unit into that same house and you can rent that unit for $800 a month. Well, yeah, that might increase the property value. But even if it increased the property value to the point where that monthly payment goes from a thousand up to fifteen hundred, now you're collecting eight hundred dollars a month in rent. The net payment for the homeowner is now seven hundred a month instead of a thousand dollars a month, and now you've got a rental unit that's running at eight hundred a month instead of fifteen hundred a month. So th there's nothing trickle down about this. Uh, it, it's quite the opposite. This is this is bottom up economics. This is making it possible for local renters to become local homeowners, and making it possible for uh, for some local homeowners to become landlords, uh, which we I think we all agree is preferable to to uh, more uh, out of town uh, landlords. So um, 
we, we've given this great thought and great debate, and, and I do greatly appreciate all the opinions that have been brought to the table. Um, but as it's been said, you know, our role here is, uh, is the plan commission. Our job is to play it. It's to plan for the future. Uh, it's to plan for the entire city and to try to come up with a plan that is, uh, that is the most responsible uh, way to solve tough problems for, for the entire city. Um, and uh, although this has been uh, a long and, and tedious and sometimes emotional process, um, I think I think it's working and, and we'll continue to work as has been said at, at the city council. So uh, so thank you all commissioners and public uh, and staff for all the time that you've put into this. Um, and, and I do do greatly appreciate it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support this, happy to move it along. I appreciate um, uh, the effort that everyone's put in. Uh, any other final comment before we call the roll? Commissioner Herrera? Yeah, yeah. before voting, I would like to uh, thank uh, Jackie and, and the staff for putting together the original proposal, the time and, and, and bringing this to the plan commission. Uh, we all know that this um, has been a huge investment personal investment time, you know, in, in, in putting this together. So I uh, really appreciate the, the work that our staff did and, and thank you. Of course, thank you all for your um, diligent uh, discussions and questions and um, really appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into it on all sides. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I think we are ready to call the roll on the motion to forward ZO0921 as amended to the council with a positive recommendation. Thank you. St. John? Yes. Burrell? Yes. Herrera? No. Seabor? Hold on. Oh. oh, I know why. Yes. I'm so sorry. Oh, there it is. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, yes, because he was sorry. Sandberg? No. Cockrum? Yes. Kate? No. Whistler? Yes. And Kenzie? Yes. Motion passes 6-3. Passes Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it is now after 9 p.m., um, so we are set to adjourn unless there is a motion uh, to suspend the rules to uh, introduce uh, the next item. I think we probably should, if we're not going to um, continue, do, do we need to have a motion to continue uh, 10? Yes, I believe uh, so, Mike, 21. correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I, I believe you do. It's cleanest for the public and just for uh, for procedure. If you do have a motion to continue the petition in the event that you don't decide to hear it post 9 p.m. Right. And I just would caution everybody uh, so we don't make the same mistake twice that unless the vote is unanimous here, right. the motion fails if, if there were yeah. proposed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think there's only one of two motions that, that we can really take here. One would be to suspend the rules to continue uh, the meeting and introduce uh, ZO 10-21. The other would be to continue ZO 10-21 to our next meeting, uh, which would be uh, on Monday at 5.30. Monday. Can I just for, Brad, just to clarify, when you say introduce, you mean the only thing that we would be doing now would be to have the staff introduce it and then the discussion of it would all occur on Monday, or do you mean introduce it and go for as long as we go. Right, thank you, yeah, good question. So our, our rules are that we can't reintroduce any new business after 9 p.m. Um, so if we were to introduce it, we, we could simply introduce it, have the staff presentation and then continue it after that um, and then continue uh, the remaining discussion to Monday, that's an option. Um, or we could just go ahead and, and uh, continue it now or we, someone could move to suspend the rules to um, keep on going until we finish <laughs> 10 21 tonight. I don't think anybody probably wants to do that. And that would certainly need to be, uh, unanimous, but, um, uh, but yeah, all those, all those are options. 
Um, yes, Commissioner St. John, go ahead. I'd like to motion that we continue ZO-10-21 proposed zoning map to Monday to our 5.30 meeting, which is April 5th, 6th, 5th, 5th, 5th. Thank you. We have a we have a second to continue to the fifth. Um, let's call the roll. Burrell? Yes. Herrera? Yes. Seabor? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Cockrum? Yes. Kate? Yes. Whistler? Yes. Kinsey? Yes. In St. John, motion passes yes. 9-0. Uh, All there right, so. It's a little housekeeping we should probably discuss here and we can do this offline as well. The chances that we will get through the map and the six amendments that have already been proposed mm. on Monday night are probably slim based on our past experiences together. Um, so uh, what I will do is either later tonight or first thing tomorrow, what's tomorrow? First, either tonight or tomorrow, I can send an email, um, obviously based on our schedule we've been doing, then the next meeting would be Thursday. We have only planned out, uh, we have only noticed and told the public about meetings through Monday the 5th. So uh, that means also we haven't asked any of you if you're available on uh, any other days. Um, so uh, I, I, I think um, that the next meeting, any, again, based on what we've been doing would be uh, to have a second meeting in the same week on the 8th. So if any of you have know that you have a conflict with that, um, we could say it right here and I could propose, you know, uh, think about proposing a different day or I can email all of you uh, and we can do it that way. Um, obviously, you all know, um, members of the public know as well, Susan knows best uh, that uh, this has to go to council and um, there is a time limitation on not only how long they can see it, but how many days they have before their summer recess is to be uh, started. So um, we want to respect that and give them as much time as possible. Um, so uh, we have to balance that obviously with giving you as much time as possible with the map. Um, so my suggestion would be, um, okay, we are, okay, we have, yeah, we may not be able to do Thursday, that's fine. So I will send out an email tomorrow and see, obviously Wednesdays get hard. Um, with council, of course, Susan needing to be uh, there um, uh, pretty much every week, I think. <laughs> and um, uh, so I will see if people might be available to do back to back Monday, Tuesday, and otherwise we'll have to explore moving into another week. Um, so just so the public knows that that schedule hasn't been set yet. And as soon as we have um, agreement um, on plan commission, we will let you know uh, when when the next hearing will be after Monday. So come back Monday, we'll start the map, get as far as we possibly can. It just feels unlikely that we'll finish. Uh, and so then we will hopefully have a plan by then um, to uh, discuss uh, when we will meet after that. Does that sound okay to everybody? Yeah, Jackie, you're not saying Monday, Tuesday next week, correct? I am saying that. <laughs> Okay, I, I'm scheduled to give a uh, um, uh, be a part of a petition to the county planning commission. Got it. Yeah. Yep, those Tuesday been been to those. Okay, well we will. Um, yeah, well we'll just send around the group and see see what everybody can do. And it looks like we might be bumping into the next week. Um, and we'll just try to get it done as quickly as possible. So, okay. So Jackie, yeah, yeah, so uh, as far as I understand, we won't be able maybe to cover all six amendments on Monday. It would be a spread. Out Monday and the following, any any other meeting after that? It sounds, I mean, if we can do the staff presentation, public comment on six amendments and public comment on the map on Monday night, I that would be great. I'd love it. Let's do it. <laughs> but uh, just based on how long these meetings have gone, I'm not sure we'll go that far. I don't know that they will all actually be introduced uh, and discussed. I'm not um, sure how that will, part will shake out. Um, but, uh, yeah, what I'm saying is we'll definitely meet on Monday. It seems like we'll have to meet at least one other time. Um, there is something for you all to think about, um, uh, changing the, um, comment, uh, public comment, uh, time limit for amendments as like we did on this one is something that's in your purview that doesn't require unanimous vote. Um, so that may be, uh, 
because because the amendments um, are so specific to such specific areas, um, a shortened public comment time may still be appropriate. Um, where we have seen here with the plexes that often public comment on an amendment strays into a public comment on the overall petition, uh, where a shorter time period may uh, encourage people to focus on the actual amendment at hand, uh, and that could save us some time as well. Um, uh, so. Yes, we will get as much done as we can on Monday, but I think it's likely we might keep going. I, I have a question uh, because uh, I won't be able to be here on, on Monday. I'm representing the Board of Par uh, Commissioners, and I just wonder if uh, a, one of the other Park Commissioners could be here or is uh, just absent. If I believe that uh, I, I will verify with Mike and the rules, but I believe that yes, you would send a proxy from oh. the Park Commission. Yeah, yeah, excuse since now because I have a campus recognition, so I won't be able to come on Monday. Sure. Yeah. Okay, and then, yeah, and then as similarly to what um, Jillian and Chris did, then catching up after uh, would be helpful and we can ob obviously also staff can help with that. So going from here, I guess we'll see you all on Monday and um, please do think about um, possibly uh, again limiting public comment, maybe even shorter than we did uh, because these amendments are so tight and specific to little specific areas. I don't know if that seems appropriate or if we want, uh, if we think people will have uh, a lot of substantive comments about each area. Um, uh, that'd be something for you guys to consider to shorten the time. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. I would I would be I would be very surprised if we had as much public comment on these as we do uh, as we have on on the the ones we've just considered. But um, just logistically getting you know through all of the motions on six amendments, even if there's not a lot of public comment, that's still just going to take some time for us to get through that. Though, well, I will do my very best to keep us moving. Um, but I do think it's wise for us to start planning for uh, an additional. Uh, session just in case we can't get through them. Um, and of course, um, the sooner the better, right? Because we do, we do kind of have that, that city council uh, recess um, that's kind of looming there. Um, and, and we need to um, try to get this uh, to them as soon as we can. Okay. So we'll send out, uh, staff will send out a contact and see um, everyone's availability over the next two weeks. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank um, you. That concludes our business. So we are adjourned. Thank you.